bullshit. He watches his mother shoot his father three times in the back. I'm Mr. Blackland, there the premieres. I look like Quasimodo to you. What about Tony Lauer? What about China? Big speech of the death man. Impact. A bad show. Yeah, really, that's all you can say. It was not a horrible show. Not an embarrassing show. Not a painful show. It was just bad. What did you say? It wasn't a what? It wasn't embarrassing. It, wasn't it was embarrassing. All right, fine. It was embarrassing. Go on. I, I thought it was not horrible. It was horrible. It was not painful. It was painful. I thought this was merely a bad wrestling show. Well, I think when we recap it, perhaps you'll change your mind. That's entirely possible. I found this to be bad, horrible, horrifying, wretched, shitty, incomprehensible, confusing, erratic. Erratic would imply it had high points. Which would counteract kind of most of what you're saying. That is not... No, it wouldn't mean it has high points. It just means it had uh, uh, peaks and valleys. And a peak, Brian, would be a high point. Not necessarily. Oh, uh, tell me more, uh, there, Mr. Mr. Webster. There could be a peak at sea level, and then you fall into the sea. That's still a high point. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't consider it a high point. Uh, I don't, Why am I arguing this? What? Why am I, I wasting my life arguing about you with you about the definition between a peak and a high point? I, I, because a high point, when you say a high point, that indicates goodness. A, a peak does not necessarily mean goodness. There's a big difference. So these peaks were, in fact, low high points. Yeah. It was a, a, a peak. What a show this is. <laughs> well, look at it this way. If you said, um, okay, I'll put it, look at this. I'm waiting. If you say, you know, that one time I kissed a girl in junior high, which would have been the last time for you. Oh, that was zing. A, that oh, was you a, got me. Uh, oh, heart right to the heart. Right down you. That would be a high point of your life. You see what I mean? Right? Sure. Okay. Now, if you said, I once had needles stuck into my penis. Okay. That is the peak of pain. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> You're such an idiot. <laughs> a, a high point indicates something positive. You just said, show I peaks and valleys. So what you are saying, then, if I understand you, is that the peak of TNA is similar to having needles inserted into your schlong. Yeah. It's actually, it is. Perhaps I hadn't thought of that, but now that you mentioned that, that's exactly what it is. Perhaps we understand each other now. <laughs> See? Exactly. Exactly. A, a high point is a positive, and a peak is not necessarily a positive. So anyway, this show was erratic. It had pins stuck in your penis, and it had things much worse. And it got worse. Yeah. it's exactly what happened. I hate impact. Let me tell you something, everybody. Let me tell you how much I hate this program. We didn't see impact last week. We didn't see SmackDown either. At least I didn't. I was gone, and here it is a week later, and and I I I, I was actually I'm, I'm sorry. Let me, let me uh, oh Jesus I should just edit this. Hold on. <laughs> now I can't edit this because then no one will know what I edited. All right, just pretend I never said that. What I meant to say is I missed SmackDown. Like on on Friday when we were going to record, uh, I got to erase that. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm going to do. No, you on. insecure pussy. No, hold on. This is what I'm going to do. All right, I just went back and I edited out what I said. You've changed history. I have changed history. I couldn't even bring myself to 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 allow what I said to stay into perpetuity because somebody would insert it into drops, and I did not mean that. So anyway, as I was saying, after a week, I I missed SmackDown. I was sad on 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 Friday when we had to recap all the UFC stuff and ECW, and I didn't get a chance to watch SmackDown. I was like, did I say it again? I don't think I, don't I think did. you did. I wasn't I listening to you, really. But anyway, I, I was sad that I didn't get a chance to watch SmackDown, because for some reason I, I missed that show. I don't even know why, and I really don't know why after actually watching it, but I, I, I missed it in some strange way. Impact, I did not miss at all. I didn't miss it a goddamn bit. 
I, I, in fact, I missed two impacts. I, well, well, I, I saw this one, but as of as of three hours ago, I'd missed the live show and this past week's show. I hadn't even watched them yet. Didn't matter to me. See, here's the way I look at it. And it, it Hold on, I'm not done yet. Of course not. So I, I, I had no desire to see these two shows. Like, it didn't bother me at all that I missed them. And this used to bother me when I missed a show. I had to see the show, not with Impact. And the other thing is, when Impact opened, since I watch every single Impact, every single fucking Impact, since I watched this show, and this happened earlier in the year, too, or last year, since I watch every show... When they show the the recap of last week, I always watch it, and I, I watch it, and I think, if somebody tuned into this show today and watched this recap, they would have no idea what happened last week. Absolutely no fucking idea. I can confirm this. Because we missed one week. I did not watch Impact last week, and they showed a recap, supposedly, of what happened last week. I have no idea what's going on. The only thing I got out of the entire recap was that Sting returned. That's it. So. I got out of this. I have paid very close attention. Hold on. I'm almost done. God damn it. Do I even have to talk on the show? You will since I'm done. So, as I've said many times, that segment is useless. Because if you watch the show, you don't need a recap of the week before. And if you don't watch the show, the recap does not help you know what happened in the week you missed. So that's a full minute of useless information by TNA. And that's the entire show in general. Well, it is, in fact, useless. But, yes, the, the, the opening recap is, in fact, a waste of time, as we've been saying for a year. It's been confirmed. But, yes, I got down. That I, I, I took note that there was goofiness involving Kurt Angle. Awesome Kong beat somebody. Robert Roode and Booker T are still feuding. There's one other note in there somewhere. Sting returned. Sting returned and was and was immediately jumped by James Storm. Yeah. Okay. Great. No, and, all, and all I could think was, isn't the main event of the pay per view Joe and Angle? <laughs> Shouldn't there be something involving those two? And there was goofiness involved with Kurt Angle. I saw him quickly involved with AJ Styles and wacky amateur headgear, and I thought, wow, that's uh, silly. They showed it for one second. Yeah. I have no idea what happened in that match. I have no idea what happened in that match. So here's the way I looked at uh, the Impact and, and SmackDown thing last week. I didn't miss SmackDown in the sense that it never occurred to me we weren't watching it. I, 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 Friday, Saturday, something went by. I never once thought, hey, we didn't watch SmackDown this week. It just it skipped my mind entirely. I was constantly aware that we were not watching Impact, and it filled me with joy. <laughs> my, 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 my steps were lighter. My heart sang a little more. I was always happy because I knew I had missed an episode of Impact. It was grand. It was glorious. Then we watched it this week, and I was back down to being sad. I would never watch this program if this were not my job. Fuck no. I would never watch this program. And, and uh, you know, the other thing, it always gets a 1-1, one, one, or in the case of the live show, a 1-0. One. One, oh. <laughs> Biggest yeah, impact fuckers. ever. Anyway, the point is, you know why they don't ever get any new viewers? Because Sucks. how could they? No, how could they? If you were a new viewer and you turned to the show, you'd have no idea what was going on, and nobody would fill you in. No. And and you could watch this show week after week and never know what was going on. We it's, do. It's 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 useless to watch this program. They will never get any new viewers or any new buyers. It's just a a failure of a television show in every conceivable way. So anyway, let's talk about this shit fest here. Open up with Borash outside Cornette's office. There was screaming. He hyped up the matches for tonight. Cornette came out and was yelling about somebody in the office whose name he did not bother to mention. He talked about this guy the whole time and then ran off. And then Matt Morgan came out of the office and said he'd stepped in. And JB said, all right. And uh, then it was over. The first segment of the TV show, nobody has any idea what's going on. Somewhere in here, I did get the message that somebody had somehow added a fifth member to uh, Team Tomko at the pay-per-view, thus implying that I was thinking, okay, so Team we know, we know the five guys on Team Tomko, and Team K's will name their fourth guy tonight. That's the message I got out of this. You got what? I got the message that Team Tomko had a fifth man, and thus, that, that was the message I got, and thus I put it into my head, okay, we will then learn who Team Cage's fifth guy is at the end of the show. Oh, you said fourth man. That's what confused me. I may have. So, anyway, this was stupid. It gets dumber. It's significantly dumber right now. AJ Tomko and Team 3D came out. And as noted, the bad guys have an extra man. Yes, the bad guys, everybody. At least they figured that part out. They didn't give the extra man to the good guys. So, 
they uh, they came out and they cut a promo and uh, they announced their fifth man was James Storm. And as he came out, we got the baby faces coming down the ramp. Christian Sting, Kevin Nash, and Rhino. All wearing black shirts that had Team Cage and block letters printed on them. Not 999 at the local mall. Single buy. <laughs> Not a single shirt sold. So Cage cut a promo, and he called out Matt Morgan, saying he wanted to see his big, goofy ass. I would not have come out if I were Matt Morgan, but he's stupid, so he came out. And uh, crowd chanted, Morgan sucks. And this is what happened. Christian started crying that the heels got five men and they only had four. Nothing in the world better than baby faces crying. So he's crying about this and he goes, Morgan, what are you going to do for us? And Morgan basically said, go get a man. I don't give a fuck. Get one of the MMA guys that, that uh, Joe's training with. Get somebody from outside the company. Get whoever you want. I don't care. So then Christian said, never mind. <laughs> we'll just do four on five. I'm good with these four. Yeah. <laughs> so this segment was an epic failure in is every there way. An, is there something I'm missing here? Well. He cried about it. He was told to just go get a man. And then he said, no, we don't need a man. That's what I saw as well, yes. Badness. <laughs> <laughs> this makes any sense. So, yes, at the end of this segment, we thought we were going to get to the pay-per-view a handicap war games match. Which, again, as I asked you earlier, why is this a bad thing? For, for uh, what is it, five-minute intervals? Something like that. So, for 20 minutes, it won't matter. It's a, it's a baby face and a heel in the ring, and then you do a fucking coin flip. So, it's either going to be advantage or disadvantage baby faces the entire time. The entire time until the very end. So why does this matter? Well, because at the end, that's when you determine who wins. If, if you if, if it can't end until everyone's in the ring, and when everyone's in the ring, I would rather have four, five guys on my team than four. It's still retarded. Well, it is. Don't get me wrong. I, <laughs> the absurdity of a handicap war games match. Plus the fact that the whole idea is that the baby faces lose the coin toss, so it's a fucking handicap match the whole time that's anyway. That's right. That's why it's all so dumb. Also, you will know the last. It's week... like it's like Vince Russo takes every concept in wrestling and just goes, "How can I make this dumber?" Oh, as we'll prove later. By the way, we will prove later how he can take the stupidest thing ever and make it even stupider. It's amazing. But we also learned that Sting returned last week and got attacked by James Storm. So you think, okay, they're gonna have the War Games match at the pay per view, and then maybe the next pay per view they have a singles. No, wrong. They're wrestling in the main event of this show. Borash interviewed Angle, and he said he was going to make sure Joe would retire if he didn't win at the pay-per-view. Borash wanted to know what he was going to do about it. Angle said, you'll find out. Eric Young came up talking about how Super Eric was there tonight, and Angle said he was a fool. And then as he walked off, Eric said, you're a, you're no superhero. You have no mask or cape. Some of you might recall uh, a couple of weeks ago, Angle did an interview talking about it's going to be more serious from now on, much more serious project, product. Meanwhile, here he is in the insanity, in the goofiness. In the retardity. TNA, everybody. This show sucks. We had Steiner zooming into the arena. Go, seriously going about 50 miles an hour. PD Williams was on the hood of his car holding on for dear life. Had he slipped off, he would have died. As in, his life would have ended and we would be doing an obituary in the newsletter this week. And uh, the segment was about 10 seconds long. This was straight out of WCW. Put a guy's life in danger with something involving an automobile for a stupid-ass segment that no one's going to remember in five minutes. I get angry. Yeah, well, I I don't know if callous disregard for human life is the right word or just complete unawareness. that <laughs> you, you would think they were not aware that anyone in wrestling ever died. Or in fact, it happens all the time. And this was so dangerous, and there was zero benefit to it. No one's buying the pay-per-view because P.D. Williams was on the hood of this car. No one is tuning in next week to see who's in the hood of the hood of the car. No one's going to buy a P.D. Williams T-shirt. No, there was no upside here, and the downside was that P.D. Williams could easily have died. Black Rain, Relic, Lance Hoyt, and Jimmy Rave are now the monsters of rock. Vinny, you should be marking out. I actually was. Did a promo together. <laughs> they did a horrible indie wrestling promo of the the fake rock stars and the fake monsters and. 
Relic is standing there talking as his, his the blinking lights in his mask are going off, and Christy is singing and distracting him, and it, it, they both made each other look bad. It was this remarkable reverse synergy. <laughs> they, they both made the other ones look even more phony than normal, and it was just wacky and carnival, and it was stupid, but it was stupid in a train wreck, train wreck way. And I was entertained. Monsters of Rock against LAX and the Motor City Machine Guns. Machine Guns ran wild. It was great. They cut off Homicide, went to work. Hernandez has grown a mustache, by the way. <laughs> it rules. Anyway. Maybe he heard your show. Eight-way. Hernandez uh, killed Rave with the border toss for the pin. And a very fun TV match, if you uh, if you forget the whole part about how there was a commercial right in the middle of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I figured something out on this show, because every match has a commercial in the middle of it. And it's always right when the heel gets the heat, they go to commercial. And then right when they come back from commercial, the baby face makes a comeback. So you never see the heels actually getting the heat on anybody. So it sucks to be a heel in this company, mm-hmm. because you're never shown to be dominant at any point. You never get to win. You never get to win on anybody no. when you're a heel. And when you're a baby face, it always takes more of you than there are heels to win a fair fight. Or an unfair fight. As we will get to here shortly. The advantage must be for the baby faces in order for them to win a fight. So really, in TNA, it sucks to be a baby face and it sucks to be a heel. And it sucks most of all to be a fan. It's just it wretched. It sucks to be everyone. I will note there was a sign before this match held up in the audience that said, Rock and Rave, inf- Rock and Rave Infection equals no buys. Now. Really? Yes. Oh. Now, I'm going to assume that whoever <laughs> awesome. held up this sign was, in fact, a, a member of the board or a listener of the show. Thank you, whoever that is. Yes, we appreciate the plug. However, you are wrong. And Rock and Rave Infection equals buys. They entertain me. That, I enjoy their clown show. That's still no buys. Fine. <laughs> but it's buys for me. I, will you buy the pay-per-view next week? Maybe I will. Really? Because I'm not buying it. Cool, we won't watch it. <laughs> no, you have to buy it. I would rather watch the Rock and Rave Infection than, for example, Super Eric. Or Jay Lethal? I just want to know if you would actually put your money where your mouth is and pay for the TNA pay-per-view this month. It's not buys. <laughs> exactly! No buys! But when you say no buys, it's such a strong negative connotation. It is! They're not selling any fucking buys! No, this goes back to your Peaks and Valleys things. This, there's no buys and there's no buys. <laughs> this is not no buys. This is just yeah, no buys. Shut up. So anyway, th- then you asked why I enjoyed the show because the match was fun. The machine guns looked awesome. LAX looked awesome. You enjoyed the show? Well, I'd say I enjoyed the show. I, I, you asked why I said this is merely a bad show and I not see. special or embarrassing or anything. And it's because this the wrestling was fun, including this match. Including this match where afterwards... There was stupidity. We had a four Don't get on, me wrong. Four on four, and of course the heels at that point were beat on the baby faces, so Kaz ran down. It was five on four, advantage baby faces. The heels were still beating them up. So what a finally, pussy Kaz turned out Super to be. Eric had to make the save. It was a six on four baby face advantage before the baby faces could clear the ring. Yes. So it was equal. It was four. In fact, the baby faces won. So they had the advantage, these four on four. Then Kaz ran out, and they started to get beaten. So Kaz actually counts for negative more than one. They were actually beaten before Kaz ran out. So anyway, it doesn't matter. It's retarded. Borash interviewed Sting, said it was really good to be back in TNA, which had to be a lie since he was making ten grand every week to sit at home and do nothing. Said he was going to make James Storm a star tonight, and for those of you keeping track, he did not. More with Kip and BG. This was the best one yet because uh, both guys actually talked about how they wanted to beat the shit out of each other for once. It did talk about how old they were, how much they didn't care about wrestling, uh, or how they shitty were. they were in TNA. Or so how this, they had the most success somewhere else. I don't know why BG is doing all of his promos at a playground, but uh, I'll take his, uh, you know. <laughs> he looks way too much like Larry the Cable Guy as well. And we had sit-down interview with Awesome Kong and Raish Saeed. This was so stupid. First off, Tony Tanay said, there are stipulations. I can't ask questions too personal, and the interview can end at any time for any reason. <clears throat> he then proceeded to ask four questions, which took about 20 seconds to answer, such as, where are you from? And uh, Saeed said, Syria, so on and so forth, and then it just ended. This accomplished nothing. Accomplished nothing. I just uh, The two things I liked most about this were Tanay said, there are certain rules I cannot ask personal questions. No, nothing too personal. Nothing no, too personal. Well, maybe that's why I was confused. This, this was not the stupidest part of this. The first thing he said was, where are you from? Which is, in fact, a personal question. Number two, Raisa Saeed said Kong was from America. That was stupid. <laughs> he said Kong's from Skull Island. <laughs> 
They're always stupid. This, this accomplished nothing. Then we had video airing about Consequences Creed. I guess he's coming back. I didn't even not only know he was gone, I didn't even know he'd ever been there. I vaguely remember him being involved in something, but this is hardly a big return. James Storm did an interview. He's not even hurt after the scaffold. He just started drinking again. Awesome. He enjoyed his time It gets off. better. I got I to gotta bring this up. Okay. Remember all those things with Shark Boy being injured and almost on his death? And he was on his deathbed and all this other bullshit. Now a guy falls off a 20-foot scaffold and he's not hurt at all. No. And they already have the thing with Tracy where she's like, look at my back. Do you see the scars from this whipping? And Crystal goes, no. And Tracy goes, that's right, they've healed. <laughs> the whipping wasn't so bad. What? <laughs> she killed their own angle. They killed all their own angles here. Every stipulation on the pay-per-view, they just killed it. Yeah. The he last fell off the scaffold. Di- he's not hurt. No. She got whipped. She don't care. No. She healed. Don't anyone worry about anything that ever happens in TNA because everyone will just get better anyway. No. There's no consequences of anything. AJ and Tomko against Rhino and Christian. Another good match with a break, of course. And uh, then when they came back, Christian made his hot tag. And well, no, he didn't, actually. Uh, he did, but the ref didn't see it. So then Rhino beat up the ref, and Mike Tanay said, This is how you take frustrations out! No. I'm not going to... St- I enjoyed this segment, and thus I will not nitpick those details. I will just say, they got the heat on Christian, and when I say heat, the building was insane. People were so into this. And they cut him off forever and ever and ever, and they did false tag one... Rhino had to go back. They did a false tag two. Rhino had enough. He gored the ref, and that place went ballistic. He mm. was so into this referee dying, and then the baby faces ran wild some more, and everyone was going crazy, and this is this is all so much fun. Yeah, and then uh, 3D hit the ring for the beatdown. Nash made the save with a chair. Cornette came out and said that baby faces needed to be disqualified, and Don West couldn't understand why. Yes, he was mystified. How can you say that? Well, Don, one of them physically attacked the ref. Yeah. Cornette was backstage screaming at Morgan about the fifth member thing. Apparently he missed a segment where Morgan said they could just get a fifth man if they wanted one. And he said tonight, Morgan said tonight he was going to referee Sting versus James Storm and guaranteed no one from War Games would interfere. Cornette said, you better hope so or you might lose your job. Oh, no. So Cal Val and Jay Lethal were in a hot tub. I guess Lethal was too cheap to buy water or something of that nature. He was saying he was too cheap to have one in his house and also too cheap to check into a hotel where they had one. So they snuck into a hotel to get in this hot tub. Yeah. This is the worst series of segments ever. There's your champion, everybody. What a clown. So they were about to kiss when Sanjay Dutt rose up out of the water and broke it up. And Yeah, they didn't know the whole time he was in there. They didn't know. Didn't see a snorkel. Didn't bump into a, a, a random man. Just showed up. And it all went about 20 seconds. So lame. Shark Boy and Elix Skipper in an Escape the Cage match. The most interesting thing about this match is when Shark Boy won with the stunner, there were boos. So, anyway, he's in the Escape the Cage match after winning this, and who could care? I don't know. He does everything like Steve Austin, including the top rope Rana. Yeah. Just, just like old Stone Cold used to do. Tracy did a promo saying she wasn't hurt. And then Angelina Love and Velvet Sky came up, and or Angelina Sky and Velvet Love, I don't know. Who cares? Velvet Love is actually a more pornographic name than Velvet Sky, but I'm not the writer. Anyway, they said that uh, they leave her alone tonight, but you better watch yourself in the future, which is Carney for we're going to run in after your match, which is exactly what happened. Uh, Peyton and Tracy, Tracy won. Peyton did not look good. Uh, then Team Prawn jumped Tracy, Salinas made the save, then Jackie, then Roxy Laveau. Then... Every girl on earth hit the ring. I wrote Christy Hummer. Oops. Well, what were you thinking about there, Brian? Actually, I'm sorry, I wrote Hammer. I just added an R. Then uh, Charmel with the strap cleared the ring of the uh, heels, and then Booker came down and asked Charmel to come to the back. This was not the uh, winner of a woman segment that we see every week. But uh, I guess they're going to have a... Oh, we'll actually get into that in a moment, what they're going to be doing with the women. Oh, you missed a segment here, briefly. It was a brief segment, but Shark Boy was cutting a promo backstage in which Crystal announced that there would be an Escape the Cage match, and she said, she said the rules would be easy. And every time anyone in TNA says the rules will be easy, I always think back to Scott Hudson trying to explain King of the Mountain and saying it's really very simple. Oh, yeah. Now, this is not as complicated as King of the Mountain, but 
There are six dudes. They're going to be they're going to be in a cage. I think I've already forgotten this. <laughs> escape the cage, and then the last two have a match. No. Wait, how does it work? Do they have to escape the cage to qualify? I don't know. I forget now. Yeah, I didn't write it down, but I have no idea. There's six dudes in a cage match, and there's complicated rules that I thought I would remember, and I have failed. <laughs> You're an idiot. Well, I'm an idiot, but they've also... They, they are have, the bigger idiots. They have failed to idiot-proof this. They are bigger idiots. Did you know the rules? Well, no, but you're the idiot because you thought you'd remember. Well, did you think you'd remember? I didn't want to remember. I just gave up as soon as he said, it's really quite simple. I was like, no, it's not. I'm not going to listen. I see. You were dumb enough to think you'd remember this an hour later. It's just like the Google map in Orlando. This is what happens when I try. <laughs> just stop. So we got a Joe training session video where he was doing MMA training, hitting the pads, submission work, grappling. We've established that Joe knows a knee bar. Cut a promo about how Kurt could train all the single legs he wanted, but whenever he shot in, he was going to punch him or knee him in the face, and he was going to show him his gold medal didn't mean shit. This was awesome. Yeah, he, he was... First of all, it was all very nuts and bolts for a while, and then it cut to Joe and, and Marcus Davis standing there, and, and Joe went from discussing the strategy of the match to cutting a pro wrestling promo on Kurt about how he was going to hurt him, and he got more and more fired up and more and more passionate, and you could see Marcus Davis just marking out. He's going, yeah, yeah, get him, Joe, yeah. Then we had Angle coming out with his belt. Said next week he wanted Joe to sign a document guaranteeing that if he didn't beat Angle via pinfall or submission, he had to walk away from wrestling forever. Steiner came out with the briefcase. He said that after the pay-per-view, he was cashing it in, his world title shot. He said either Joe or Angle should be prepared. And uh, he said he'd give him a month's notice, so he was going to take his title shot at the sacrifice pay-per-view. Crowd chanted Angle's name. Angle offered his hand, and, and, and Steiner said, I am not shaking your hand. He said, I've seen Joe's training, and I've seen who he's training with, and you can't win, Kurt. And everyone went, <gasps> and then they chanted Angle's name, which was odd, and uh, that was that. Kurt came out, and he said he, he wanted Joe there. Kurt his... is supposed to be the heel, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And Steiner is supposed to be a babyface. Sure. And they chanted Kurt's name. Oh, it's an epic fail. It is. Everything they do is an epic fail. But Kurt came out, and he said he wanted Joe there next week to sign the contract. And they seemed to imply Joe would be there. And I recall Joe saying he would not be in the impact zone again until he was TNA champion. Well, they forgot. They forgot. They are not very smart. It was only like two weeks ago. Well, it's too long ago. That was a different set of tapings. Matt Morgan had a stupid fucking idea. A reverse cage match with the girls. Okay. Fuck you, Vince Russo. Just fuck you. <laughs> You'll recall earlier we mentioned that Vince Russo could take anything stupid and make it even stupider. You'll also recall that last year TNA did a reverse battle royal. You'll recall that we buried this deep beneath the earth. I believe it won the Observer Worst Match of the Year award unanimously, I think. Because <laughs> nothing else could possibly be worse. They made it worse. They put up a cage. <laughs> so now you won't be able to see anything, and it will take them a long time to get into the ring. Can this is going to suck. Oh, it's going to be horrible. And Cornette mocked the idea and then told him not to fuck up the main event refereeing or be fired. And then after he left, Cornette said, Borash, I have this great idea for lockdown. We'll take a cage. We'll put the girls on the outside, and they'll have to climb in before the match starts. And Borash is like, great idea. Yeah. I do have to admit I laughed, but it's still fucking so dumb. The, the idea is dumb. This is bad comedy. It was just a epic fail on every level. It was, it was a segment I did not enjoy, plugging something I did not want to watch. Sting and James Storm with Matt Morgan as referee. Another major commercial break. And then Sting was making a comeback when he returned. He did not make James Storm a star. And the whole, the whole uh, deal in this match is James Storm tried to use a bat... But Matt Morgan stopped him, and then Morgan threw the bat to Sting and turned his back so Sting could use it. So, yes, it was a swerve. Matt Morgan is a babyface. He will be the fifth man on the lockdown team. yippee ki motherfucker. There you go. Does that make you want to buy the pay-per-view? No. Me fuck no. I can't even believe this pay-per-view is coming Sunday. Well, they have one more show to sell it to you. I never want to watch TNA again. And you know what's funny is I'm not even angry right now. Usually, <laughs> no, I, usually I have statement. to get really, really mad to say that I never want to watch Impact again. I just get vociferously angry. Now it's just like after taking that two weeks off and not missing it at all, at all, not the slightest bit, I don't ever want to watch the show again. No, I've, I've seen the promised land of no Impact. 
Yeah. And I want to go back home. You've seen you've seen the world through my eyes. That's how I feel about this. I, I, it's, and you know what's worse about it? One. You, know, you know what's the worst part about it is impact is so bad. And I I, 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 I hate the show so much that it, it, it's spilling over into my desire to even watch the pay-per-views, which are always good. I don't want to watch this pay-per-view Dude, Sunday. I have been there for months. I don't a, want to watch any TNA again ever. No. And it's all because of impact. And it's, that's and you're not saying an emotional, rash statement. You're no. sitting back, I'm weighing saying, the pros and cons, and rationally saying I would prefer not to watch it. I have frolicked in a meadow where no TNA flowers grow, and I would love to return. Your candidate for your worst poem of 2008 is. That is my goal, is to return to that meadow. And sadly... The meadow of no impact. The snows are coming on Sunday, and that's bullshit. I hate this show. I just hate it. It's such a waste of two hours. I know! I, you I, are preaching to the choir. I just can't even believe that, that, that this is written every week so poorly. I mean, if... if, if <laughs> I don't, just don't get it. I just don't get it. It goes back to our theory that Orlando is so shitty, <laughs> nothing good can happen there. By the way, this is apparently the 400th episode of this show or something like that. So? <laughs> I wasn't going to mention it, but I figured I would or Matt Pat would be very sad. Clearly a baseball fan. I mean, it was very clear when I saw all the stats that he had for the show. Well, that's true. I mean, very, very clear that uh, that he loves... Baseball's a game of numbers in many ways. And a num- uh, sh- uh, sport of geeks. That's fine. It's just not fine. Doesn't baseball doesn't anger me as much as impact? I will say that. Would you rather, would you rather watch a baseball game or impact? Oh fuck yes, I'd rather watch a baseball game. Think about that, everybody. Ah, let us dis. Gus, Impact. This shouldn't take long. Ain't much to rant about. Although there are some things. Even a good Impact, there is still some stupidity. Team Tomko came out to hype up the pay-per-view. Bubba cut a promo, ranted about this and that, and told Morgan not to show up or he'd be killed, and buried Sting and Nash, who they were going to wrestle later, saying they were the reason WCW went out of business. Half right, at least. And More importantly, that was seven plus years ago. Well, they live in nineteen or two thousand, nineteen ninety nine, 1999, actually. I know, it's the same shit we always bitch about, but Christ! I am. I will say that Bubba Ray, say what you will about Team 3D, and there's much to say that's negative, but this guy's fucking cut some promos this year. True that, true that. He has cut some promos. I don't think he should win promo of the year by any stretch. But he should definitely be in the top five, I would think. Top five, top ten. So good for Bubba Ray. So anyway, then he was uh, talking, and out came Christian, who cut a promo that I will say was completely inexplicable. I have no earthly idea what he was talking about. But I do know that uh, that uh, it ended with the good guys chasing the bad guys out of the ring, and that was that. Okay. His, if you don't know, now you know phrase, which is so stupid, is over. So the crowd kind of lesson for that. Uh, and then AJ tr- tried, to, tried to say, don't sing it, bring it, but he screwed it up because he's a goof. And uh, as noted, the best part was, when the faces came down to fight, the heels bailed because they were, in fact, afraid of a fair fight. Yeah. Amazing. I don't know what happened, but they fucking figured it out on this show at last. Maybe for the first time ever, they went back and watched one of the shows and thought, this doesn't make any sense. We can do this better. I, I was I was flabbergasted that throughout this entire show they did it right. So then we had a uh, Joe promo in a suit, a very fat suit I might add, perhaps literally and figuratively. But he said if he did not beat Angle at the pay per view, he would walk away from wrestling forever. And then he added, and not just TNA wrestling. Yeah. Okay. Borash interviewed Kurt about the pay per view Sunday. He uh, was also quite decked out there, and he. Said Joe could say all he wanted, but uh, he wanted pen to paper. He wanted in, on writing, in writing, that if Joe did not win, he would leave wrestling forever. He said he'd beaten Joe three out of four times, and the fourth time Joe beat him, it was a fluke. I actually did not even recall the fourth match. I remember the series of three, but apparently there were four. He said Joe had a 25% chance of beating him. 
And Borash said, listen, Joe's a new man. He's training with the best fighters in the world. And Angle says, who cares? I am the best fighter in the world. He said, Joe had been training for four weeks. He'd been doing this his whole life, and uh, he was going to beat him at the pay-per-view. This was a great promo. Why do you say that? Why do I say that? Yeah. Just because he was talking about how great it was? or I don't know. I, the thing is, I don't care about Kurt and Joe anymore. They've been killed so deeply for the past year that nothing they can do or say now can make me flip a switch and care about them. I thought this was a great promo. Particularly the part where he was talking about the four matches he had, and I, I may, my memory may be slipping here, this may have been later, but they showed clips of these, the prior four matches, and they showed, it showed Angle showing up the very first time, the first fight they had, and holy crap, it was great, and Kurt won with a severe submission, and then he fought a month later, and I was reminded of how stupid it was they did it just a month later, just out of the blue, and Joe won that one by submission, but it was still a great match, and then it moved into whatever their, I think it was the fourth one, when there was, a ref bump, and Karen turned on Joe, and it reminded me of how stupid this feud was, and how stupid Joe was, and how much I just don't care. I thought this was a great promo. He he was a very serious Kurt Angle. It was not the wacky comedy bullshit. He got his point across. He said he was the best wrestler in the world. He was going to beat this man. He didn't care how much he'd been training. I thought it was very, very good. So, thumbs up for this promo. We had uh, Consequences Creed against somebody. Jimmy, Jimmy Rave. Rave. In a in a uh, escape the cage qualifier, Creed is a a TNA version of Kofi Kingston. I think he's a better worker. I don't think he has half the charisma. So he does have a better afro. Better afro. There's no disputing this. And Christie took the ref. Hoyt interfered. Of course, this was not the pin here in the second match on the show. Maybe the first match on the show was this the opener. Let me find out. That would make it even it more. Was. Yeah. It was the opener, and we had interference leading to not a pinfall. That's classic. So uh, then Kofi ended up winning, or whoever he was, Consequence Creed. So he's in the cage match at the pay-per-view, and uh, he's got a very crowd-pleasing style. He'll get over. He's a hell of an athlete. Yeah. I, I was stunned they actually gave the new guy a win in his first match. I was I was just sure they were going to get have him get beat right out the gate. But he won. He's in the escape the cage thing. The guy seems talented. I'm glad he has a job, but I don't understand why this company is hiring new guys. Why not? Well... Because they have too many already. There's too much stuff going on in the show. The show's too crowded. Are they going to go to three hours now? Perhaps. No! They will on Sunday. Chris interviewed Jay Lethal about the Escape the Cage match. SoCal Val is now his belt holder. Sanjay walked up and asked her to go shopping with him, and she just left. What a geek Jay Lethal turned out to be. A total geek. He lost his girl to Sanjay Dutt. It's it's amazing that they pushed him so hard on that pay-per-view a couple of months ago. He, he beat Angle. He beat the entire world. He beat Kurt Angle. And now he's a poor dork. He is a tool. It's like the laughing stock of the company. I, I, I just, I can't understand. I just ask myself these questions like, this has to be being done on purpose. Somebody had to have made a bet with somebody and said, let's see how deep we can bury Jay Lethal without ever actually putting him in the ring. We'll, we'll have him... We'll have him act like he has no money. We'll have him act like he's cheap. We'll have him act like his his girl gets stolen by an even bigger geek. Actually, it wouldn't be a bigger geek now. Not anymore. Now he's far cooler. Yeah, this was just such a failure. All of these skits were... Unless that was their, their goal, in which case, epic success. Yeah, lethal has been ruined. Just ruined. And they, they did so good, that one pay-per-view. I was just in awe of how good they built him up, and now he's just destroyed. Oh, the one where it was a sixth man, and the guns got taken out, and he beat up three men by himself? Three men by himself, and won back the X title, and, and saved now the look entire at him. division. Now look at him. Now look at him. he got to lose the belt on Sunday. He has to. Curry man must win. So then they plug the pay-per-view, and, and uh, I do hope the main event sells, because it is the dumbest card I've ever seen. <laughs> they were okay. <laughs> they flashed all the matches on there. There was a match, it was on screen for less than five seconds. <laughs> there were dozens of people on the screen. Yes. And Mike Tanay read 12, 12 men, 6 teams, 11 cuffs, 1 winner. And the match disappeared. Yeah. What the hell? We, he did not live, read any names. He did not read how you won. He did not read what was at stake. Nothing. No. But all we know is what I just told you. That is literally no buys. Say it again. No buys. No, say what the match is. Twelve men, six teams, eleven handcuffs, one winner. Yeah. Now keep in mind, eleven handcuffs, one winner, twelve men indicates that the match will end when everybody is handcuffed except for the one man. 
Okay. Wouldn't that make sense? I, I guess, yes. Okay, so what did they do later on in the show with Eric Young? Well, they handcuffed the guy. And then what happened? He broke free. He broke out of them. And come to think of it, he's in the match. They killed the handcuff gimmick. <laughs> this is a good impact. <laughs> this was a good impact. <laughs> they killed the handcuff gimmick to get Super Eric over. They killed the handcuff gimmick for a show with a handcuff gimmick. Yeah. That's the whole stupidity of this. Yes. If this were any other week, who cares? God, this was stupid. So then we had, uh, what do we have? Uh, Cornette said he released Matt Morgan from his contract. Morgan said he didn't care. It was his turn to shine. Then we uh, had a deal with Petey and Scott Steiner. A few weeks ago, I joked that he was being initiated into the Freemasons, and people thought I was joking. Oh, no. Oh, no. He actually used that term. They mentioned the Freemasons and the Skull and Bones, and apparently he is being in, initiated into a secret society of Scott Steiner. <laughs> that is, that's the extent of it. Yeah. <laughs> the full membership of the secret society is Scott Steiner, the end. And, you know, we missed a show uh, for WrestleMania week, and they recapped a bunch of stuff here of Scott torturing PD. It seemed like we had missed about six months. Yeah. We had seen the thing with the car. We did not see the thing with the dousing with water or the jumper cables or whatever the hell else it was. There was like nine different torture segments here that we missed. It was all on one show. Yeah. Steiner and PD then faced the Motor City Machine Guns and won uh, this Canadian Destroyer on Shelly by PD Williams. So it was a fun little match right here. Machine guns are still awesome. Yeah, they're always fun, as is uh, Petey when he's actually allowed to wrestle, and Steiner when he's being wacky. And anyway, Steiner cut a promo afterwards saying that uh, Petey was courageous and tough. So he said tonight was his last initiation. Not last test in the initiation. His last initiation. So apparently he's being initiated into a number of secret societies. And he opened up a bag. There were scissors. He said Petey needed to cut his hair off. Yes. You read that right. He had to cut his hair off. Why? Why do they flush hair matches down the toilet? I don't know. It's such an easy fucking money gimmick. Yeah. Two guys with hair, the loser gets shaved. Why would you cut this off on TV for free, number one? And number two, Petey with no hair, every generic indie guy. Except shorter. Except shorter. He's a very small human being. This is just... I know what they're going to do. They're going to dye it blonde, and yeah. he's going to be a mini Scott Steiner. In fact, by the end of this, he had his own chain mail. Yeah. But it's just, it's such a bad idea. It's a horrible idea. He'll look like every other indie geek with bleached blonde hair. And God knows we have enough of those. So, then we had a recap of Joan Angle, and talked to a bunch of guys, including Christian, Frank Trigg, and Cornette. And that was that. So Angle came out and cut a promo and, and had the contract there for the signing. And out came Joe, and who I recall had said that he was not going to return until the pay-per-view. So he's a liar. He lied. So anyway, uh, Joe said he would reassure the world that when he made a promise, he would keep it. He said he had promised if he didn't walk out as champion, he would never wrestle again anywhere. And he also guaranteed there would be no excuses. He would be standing over Kurt as world champion, sign the contract. I hope he signed it, Samoa Joe. And uh, afterwards, the fans all chanted, what did they chant, Vinny? Angle! What? Yeah. Well, you see, here's my theory on this. It was, of course, this is taped WrestleMania weekend, implying, suggesting there were fans from all over the world there who wisely do not watch TNA, and so Angle was the guy they knew. That's my guess. Huh. Unfortunately, it was all VIPs. So it was everybody that knew TNA. Well, there you go. I think they just are bad writers. Well, that's another possibility. Nobody knows who's a babyface and who's a heel. So when they finally want a babyface and a heel, nobody knows who to cheer for. Joe somehow was not cheered here in this big fucking angle before his world title. Well, win. Joe's the guy who bitched about his contract and... He is a total this, crybaby. Man of this, man of that. He... That, he, he but when a strike, basically, he said mean things about Kevin Nash, who everyone loves. He's a complete whiner. And he's a liar. And Angle is an ass kicker, and he's beat the shit out of everybody the last several weeks. So I guess it does make complete sense when you really think about it. Then we add the Gale and ODB promising to uh, rip off Raisha Saeed's robe so that ODB could have an ugly contest with her. I don't know. 
<laughs> I stopped trying to figure out ODB a long, long time ago. Roxy Laveau and Angelina Love had a pretty good match, actually. And Roxy made a big comeback and pinned her with a move called the Voodoo Drop. There's hope for Roxy. Needs to get rid of the goddamn gimmick, but there's hope for her. This was fine. She is no longer managing the Voodoo Kin Mafia. She can stop being the stupid Voodoo chick. She did smile when this is over, which was the first time she's ever shown any emotion, so that's good. And the promo with Super Eric about I was going to beat up Black Rain and unmask him, whatever that means. By the way, he didn't. Then we had another Kip BG segment, which was good. BG said they could uh, maybe beat the shit out of each other and then talk again. And Kip said, no, I'm going to beat the shit out of him and we'll never see him again. I don't ever want to look at him. I want to put him out of wrestling. They had clips of BG working out, which was completely goofy. And uh, he's the wacky redneck who's sad that uh, this man wants to beat him up. Basically the Colin Delaney and uh, BG said that uh, he was going to... I'm sorry, Kip said he was going to beat BG and become the world champion. The singles world champion, mind you. So uh, this was good. This was good. In fact, when it was over, the only pros- the only flaw in this is that when it was over, I was thinking, wow, Kip's going to beat the fuck out of that guy. Now, Kip's the heel. <laughs> I should not be excited for this. Yes. But I'm excited at all. That is a plus. They actually got me excited to watch Kip James wrestle BG James. Yeah. I'm excited for the wrong guy, but I am excited. So I will consider that a plus. Super Eric and Black Rain, Super Eric won, and uh, then, of course, Relic then ran stupidity in. stupidity happened. Actually, no. Uh, something good happened. We had uh, Relic run in, and they handcuffed him to the ropes, and Kaz made the save and was uh, beating on them one on two, and then they had two more heels run out so that the odds were completely one-sided. They fucking did this right. The heels outnumber the baby faces in one. They did not fight off against a, a, a disadvantage, or, yes, fight off against out. They did not beat up more than themselves. Why was that so hard for me to say? I have no idea. There were more heels than baby faces. Yes. It was an unfair advantage. Yes. We that, never see that in TNA. That part was good. Yes. And then Super Eric broke free and cleared the ring of everybody. That part was stupid. Eh, it was fine. Who cares? It was, uh. Because yeah, they broke the handcuff gimmick. Well, that was stupid. So then we had Sting doing the promo with Nash and said Bubba was marking out for himself. I don't know what that means. <laughs> we had the funniest promo I've ever heard. Sting is talking about the Dudleys and this and that and beating them up and this and this. And Nash goes, Sting, listen, I know your intentions are honorable, but I'm here for the money. He said this is a job. And perhaps I'm overpaid, but I'd rather be overpaid than underpaid. And you know how you get paid... You get paid by staying a main eventer. And we're going to beat them tonight, stay main eventers, and we'll keep going where I'll keep going wherever the money is. And I thought, ah, that made me laugh. That's <laughs> a hot promo. Now, now there's, there's, here are the two options, everybody. Either A, Nash is turning on the baby faces, which actually is what I think will happen, and then have a feud with Matt Morgan over tall men. Or, B, it's a Russo swerve. We're supposed to think that he's turning, but of course he does not. So it's one or the other. The remarkable thing there is that neither of those makes any sense. Of course not. I don't want to see either option. Well, Nash turning on the baby faces would at least give the heels an unfair advantage and they could win. That's true. That would make, I guess that would be slightly more logical. That would make more sense. Then we had Nash and Sting against Team 3D. Sting is still great for being a 49-year-old man. Yeah. He was really moving in this match. And Nash got the hot tag and walked wild and uh, did a bunch of stuff. And they had the double pin, and Tom Cone AJ ran in to break up the pin, but they ran in late. So the ref just stopped counting it, too. Sat there looking like an idiot. Because God forbid that 3D just loses this match. They can't. Of course not. Not right before the pay-per-view. So uh, good guys uh, good guys got attacked. And then Cage and Rhino were in next to even up, even up the numbers. But then James Storm came out, so then Tomko had the edge, Team Tomko. And uh, they were doing it right. And the fans were chanting for Morgan. And he finally ran out. And um, and uh, they had a long, long fight. They had a long fight all over the place. And uh, that was that. So but The key is it, it did work out in that it was even. Then the, the heels had a numbers advantage, and they started winning on them. And then the baby faces ran out to even the odds. And the and, the, and the, the, the combat was even. So that's what's going to happen in lockdown. So, yes, it, it, it plugged that match and how it's going to work. So that's a thumbs up. 
I think this show was good enough that I'm going to predict 30,000 buys for this pay-per-view. Mm. That is up significantly from around the 18,000 that they've been doing. Almost double, mind you. I will say 22,000. Uh, I don't think gonna it was be, that good. But I think it's going to be bigger than that. I, I think they did a good job, and there was a point here. One of, the, one of the packages they did running down the card for lockdown, I was impressed that it was so long. It was like a four-minute video package running down the card. And I say that they in, did this throughout the night. I, I say that in a good way. Holy cow. They're devoting a lot of time to make sure people know what is on the show they're going to pay for. Yeah. Cool. That the the one other impression I had was this was the Matt Morgan show. This is the show to teach you that Matt Morgan is the man, and he's going to to carry the babyface team to victory. And that's weird because yeah. <laughs> he's never been the man before. <laughs> We're here to talk about lockdown. Now, I don't want to, as I mentioned before, I don't like to make fun of people for their opinions, as you're all aware. No, no, you're a very open-minded man. I'm a very open-minded man. I, I understand that some people like things and other people don't, and that's totally fine. However, those of you that didn't like the lockdown show, seriously, <laughs> what the fuck do you want in a pay-per-view? I don't know. <laughs> this is a little mystery to me. When, when, when you mentioned you got an email from somebody who, who really hated the show, all I could think was, they must hate all MMA, and they thought the main event wasn't phony enough. That's the only thing I come up with. They, I, it's actually, I went on the board, and and I was just reading. There, there were so many people that thought this was a bad show, and and a bad main event, and people saying that that Sean and Flair was a better match. And now, God bless Sean and Flair, my two of my favorite wrestlers of all time, maybe my two favorite wrestlers of all time. This was much better. Yes. I hate to break it to you. In every conceivable and manner. This is the other thing that I don't... This is, I've never understood this, okay? People always talk about how I'm, I'm anti-TNA and I hate TNA and this and that. And I've said many times, I just hate Impact. I just hate Impact. And actually, I liked Impact this week. But normally, I, I just hate Impact. It's not a, a TNA thing. And, and I, am, I am perfectly able to say when Impact is good. Now, we have a big TNA fan on the board, Crumbly. Mm. Huge TNA fan. He's the one. He's got Jeff Jarrett and his, his avatar, or his SIG, or he used to, and, and he's, he's always talking about how great TNA is. And, and I always sit there and I think, I can't respect you. <laughs> I cannot take anything you say seriously now. This is not about, I mean, the, the, if you like TNA, great, okay? But you, I, I just cannot respect anybody who's going to tell me that everything this company does is great. It's just plain not true. It is false, yes. Just like it is not true that everything that TNA does sucks. Okay? There were things on this show, granted, that were dumb. These people do not know how to do war games. No, that's fine. clear. That is clear. That's fine. There were some things on this show that were dumb. There were some matches that really weren't very good. But you know what? This was a great pay-per-view. <laughs> this was a great pay-per-view. They did the biggest crowd they've ever drawn anywhere in the world. These fans were going nuts for everything. Mm -hmm. They went nuts for the main event. There was a, a segment of the crowd that, that wasn't going nuts for the main event, but you're going to have that anywhere. But the crowd overall was going nuts for this main event. They went nuts for the entire show. They went nuts for things that I was baffled that they went nuts for, but hey, they went nuts for it. These were not the geeks from the Impact Zone. This was a brand new crowd from Lowell, Massachusetts. Northeast geeks. This was a success of yes. a show. Yeah. And I can sit here and tell you that I hate Impact more than maybe anybody else on this earth, but I can tell you that this was a good show. And so I, I, I just, I, I, I cannot take seriously anybody who's, who goes one way or the other that says everything TNA does is great. Even the worst impact I thought was good. Bullshit. You're a liar. You're a fucking liar. <laughs> and the same goes for anybody that says that every TNA show sucks. And anybody that thought this was bad, I just don't understand. Well, you mentioned... Okay, I'll say this, though. If you, if you didn't like the MMA stuff in the main event, fine. You're behind the times, but fine. It was still great. It's just like a Briscoe's match. I've said this many, many times. I've watched a Briscoe's match. I'm the sort of guy that would love to go in there with Buddy Wayne, like we did in Tulalip, and have nothing. In <laughs> fact, let me tell you how nothing we had. Caden wanted us to do a 10-minute draw. 
We did a Frankensteiner finish in nine minutes. Oh. Just that's what we wanted to do. Okay. This is what I like. We had no spots planned. Not a single fucking spot plan. We went in there. We didn't touch each other. Nobody got hurt. The people enjoyed it. Everything's happy. That's my kind of wrestling. The Briscoes go in there. There's a hundred hot tags. There's all sorts of wackiness and hitting people as hard as you can. And, uh, and that's not really my cup of tea. But I watch these fucking people go absolutely insane. I watch Alan Farrell getting very upset at me because I don't like a Briscoes match. And other people as well. And I can sit here and go, that was a good match. Fine. That was a fucking three and three quarter star match. That was great. I can see that. I can understand that. If you didn't like the main event, Fine, but I cannot see how you can watch that match and say, that was a bad match. That was a fucking great match. You mentioned earlier that you don't hate TNA, you just hate Impact. I hate TNA. I hate this company. <laughs> and I will stand up before you and tell you, this show was awesome. And you, you mentioned that the first half of the War Games match, it's, it's true, it's verifiable now, they have no idea what the point of War Games is or how to make it work. But as I sat there hating it, I could, t- couldn't help but notice that the thousands of people in the building... Loved it. Yes. So you know what? Who cares if they're not doing it, quote, unquote, right? They were doing it. Whatever they were doing, it worked. So, fuck, who cares? That's the whole point of wrestling. Yes. It's whatever works, works. Yes. And this goddamn pay-per-view worked. And this pay-per-view is going to do the biggest buy rate TNA's done probably since the first Kurt Angle-Joe match. And people will still be talking about how this was a failure. Well, I'm afraid to tell you, you're wrong. So, let's run down this fabulous little show here. And... I will know it is. We almost didn't see it. As yes, we almost didn't see it. I, I, uh, people keep telling me to get a dish, and uh, I may end up having to get a dish here. Wouldn't you have to move to do that? Well, there, there was a tree in the way. <laughs> there, yes, I know you use the term "was." I'm not sure I can cut this tree down. Mm. Okay, so a dish may not be feasible. But the, the deal with Comcast, these people are so fucking retarded that you actually had a great idea, and that is, I should call them and record the conversation for the beginning of the next show. Yes. I, I just need to record this so you can all hear the utter idiocy of these motherfuckers. I tried to order the show at 5 Pacific, and it recorded. It said, your purchase has been made, blah, blah, blah. I went out there at uh, at 5 minutes before. The pre-show was airing. The little record light was on. Everything was going great. I go out there at the first break after Observer Live. Black screen. Mm. Black screen. Bad times. I go to uh, play the recording. And as has happened in the past, it played all the way up to, to five minutes before the show and then just froze. And I don't mean like I, I had recorded black. I mean it just froze. And my, my DVR was just broken at this point. Mm-hmm. It's happened before, last time. So, of course, I called these bastards at 7.50 to order the pay-per-view by phone. Since when I tried to order with the clicker, which is how you normally order pay-per-views, it said your order cannot be processed or some such bullshit. No, that's exactly what it said. There, there was no other explanation. Your order cannot be processed. I watched it. I was on your screen. Please call one eight seven seven. Fuck you. Mm-hmm. So I I call the number and I get a human, and I said hi. I tried to order the show at five. Actually, you are taking a shortcut. I am taking a shortcut. I know. I know we want to get a lot of stuff in. You called the number first. You got two busy signals twice. Yes. Third time after a very long, complicated menu process in which I believe you had to in- input your information twice. Yes. Because this was on speakerphone, so I heard it all. That's when I knew we had to record this next time. After about five minutes of this, you finally spoke to a human being. I did. I did. So I, I speak to a human, and I said, hi, I tried to order the show at five, and it just didn't come on. And he goes, well, let me check your dealia, Bob, here. And he starts going through everything, and I was like, well, hey, uh, uh, can I order it now? Can I, can I order it before you start looking for whether it recorded at five? Let's order the eight o'clock one now. And he's like, okay, let me get that done for you. And you hear this typing, and then he goes, all right, can you see it? And I said, no, there's nothing. He goes, okay, change the channel and come back. Nothing. I got a little note on the screen that said, your order cannot be processed. He said, what's it say? I said, my order cannot be processed. He goes, what else does it say? Nothing, that's it. Hmm, he says. Well, hold on. Disappears for a good five minutes. We heard the world's shittiest uh, music as we waited. And, and it wasn't even coming in clearly. No. It was like an out-of-a-tune radio station. Sure. Like when you're driving in the middle of the desert. Like they put a phone up next to a, a wind-up radio. And the radio was winding down, yes. So they, they, they comes back on, and he goes, okay, what do you see now? I said, blank screen. He goes, okay, switch it to a low number, like 55. So I switched it to 55 and switched it back, and nothing. He goes, what does it say? I said, nothing, it's blank. 
Well, what does it say? I said, well, let me try to order the goddamn thing. So I hit order again, and it says, your order cannot be processed. He goes, hold on a minute, I'll be back. Disappears again. Five more fucking minutes. So finally he comes back, and and, uh, and as he starts talking about something, like we don't know what the problem is, he's saying something like this, all of a sudden it just starts playing. And I said, it started playing, and he was like so excited that it worked. He's thrilled. He was he's on like, the hook. Oh, enjoy it tonight. And I was like, gee, thanks. And I hung up. Twelve fucking minutes into the show. Yes. So thankfully we had not missed anything, but god damn, I've, I've never... I've never seen any sort of business where they're trying to sell you something and it's impossible to actually get yeah, what they indeed. Want they're providing. Yes. It's like the, the far side comic with the inconvenience store and everything's on a high shelf you just can't reach. Indeed. That's yes. what this is. Yes, and, and, and it's a monopoly. Yes. Uh, unless you can get a dish, there's no other option. There's no other option around it's here. It's not like this is on Channel 4 in the local station. Although there will be an option come this summer when Verizon will be offering cable. And since 2009, there will be the big digital switchover. I'm sure that uh, Verizon will have a number of HD channels. And I am going to switch over, and I am just going to send the nastiest fucking email I can possibly write. And I may even do a letter to the editor and see how much of this I can get published with profanity and all. Just the biggest, fuck you, Comcast. Maybe just I could buy an ad that just said, F Comcast. A full-page fucking ad in the Seattle Times. And then have the Verizon thing down at the bottom. I'll fucking advertise for them. My uh, buddy of mine's girlfriend was laid off from her job. And after a month or so, I heard she got a new gig. I said, hey, that's great. What's she doing? And she said, and they said, she's answering phones at Comcast. And I paused for like a minute. And finally, I just said, was there no job available torturing kittens or something even more evil? This is the most evil you could get. No. And this guy was clueless. It's like oh, yeah. they cannot provide what they are advertising. And the guy in charge is clueless. Anyway. Let's talk about this pay-per-view when it finally came on. Lethal Curry Man, Sanjay Dutt, Johnny Devine, Shark Boy, and Consequences Creed in the Elimination Escape the Cage match. I guess it was uh, pinfall eliminations, and then when two guys were left, you had to flee to win. So, dumb, but they had a good match for more, uh, the uh, ten minutes, I believe, that it lasted. All sorts of big spots, dives, yik-yaks, you know, that sort you of thing. You just made up a word. <laughs> I did. Finally came down to Divine and uh, Lethal after Curry Man sadly got pinned. That made me so sad. Yeah. And the big story of the match was Dutt and uh, Lethal are still pals. And so Divine tried to go out the door, but Dutt wouldn't let him. So Divine went to climb, and uh, after he had taped uh, Jay Lethal to the ropes, and Dutt ended up throwing in a knife, a knife of all things, in the same match with a man who had been stabbed by a knife in 2004 and nearly killed. That being Johnny Devine. And if you haven't listened to Observer Live yet, go now, because he was fucking awesome on that show. So anyway, he went to climb, Lethal cut himself free, and then uh, went to do a tope, and, and Dud opened the door for him. And so he basically did a tope onto the ground, nearly killed himself, but won the match, so uh, he retained the title. Fun while it lasted. We, yeah, we do not recommend doing this, but... it. It didn't make the finish awesome because it, it was just he wanted to get out of the ring and win the match as quickly as possible. The quickest way to do that was to hurl his body through space onto the floor without regard for his own safety. So it worked. The 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 first part of the match it was kind of silly, but the, the story was very simple. As you noted, Lethal and Sanji were friends, and they were double, double teaming everyone on Earth, and everything was going fine. And then when Lethal was in trouble, somebody had a big move on and went for a pin. That broke it up, and then he this cost him because he was immediately schoolboyed by Divine and pinned. And I thought to myself, well, there's the setup, and now Dutt will return angry at being screwed out of this match, and uh, the, the, and he will ta- cost Lethal the finish. And no, in fact, he saved Lethal. So for once, maybe the first time ever, TNA is showing patience. Yeah. They're doing a slow burn. Yeah. And that is good. And we had Frank Trigg doing an interview. I could have sworn he was Kurt Angle. It looks just like him. And he talked about the nerves going into a fight, what Joe and Angle must be feeling, and talked about how Angle had been here before and pro wrestling in the Olympics and how Joe had failed to beat him three times. And he basically said Joe had no chance to do this. Uh, he said nothing against Marcus Davis, but Joe wasn't going to beat Angle, and I thought they've got to do Trigg and Davis on pay-per-view. That would fucking rule. So anyway, there was one odd line when he said Joe would have the advantage on the ground. Yes, I guess yes. Olympic uh, gold medalist in wrestling. Mm-hmm. And Angle would have the advantage in the stand-up. Right. 
Okay, whatever you say. Perhaps he, perhaps he got their bio cards confused when he was studying up for this. Said it was unfortunate that Joe was going to lose because he'd done so much for wrestling and would have to retire, and this ruled. He did, however, towards the end, it took a severe downturn when he said, could Joe win? It's probable. <laughs> Oops. Yes, and then he said it was probable he may be president someday. Wrong, wrong word choice. Angelina Love, Velvet Sky, Salinas, Rocka Khan, Tracy Brooks, Christy Hemme, Jackie, and Roxy in a Queen of the Cage reverse cage match. All the chicks started outside, and you had to get inside. And the first two in there had a match. And they were only outside for about 30 seconds before Angelina got in. And then it was about another minute before Roxy got in. So they kept the idiocy outside to a minimum. Mm-hmm. So we ended up with Roxy and Angelina, and they had a... a they had a fine little women's match, all things considered. They've uh, made up Roxy. They've given her new makeup, and she's quite a pretty girl. And unfortunately, still has the shitty gimmick. And she won clean with the voodoo drop. The people were into her. And she wins a title shot against Awesome Kong. So I gave it two stars. Thumbs up. Yeah, that's fair. It, it was certainly not the disaster I was anticipating. Uh, mainly because, as you noted, they have not wasted a lot of time with the bullshit outside. Because for that first minute or a minute and a half that it was... Stuff, stuff going on outside. It was just bad brawlers doing bad brawling. And yeah. that was no buys. And then once the two people who could actually wrestle got in the ring, and they just threw everyone else to the back, and they let them have a simple little match, and it was fine, and it was it was fine. New generic blonde interviewed Joe. She's also horrible. Oh, God. She's generic and just generic. She's Lauren. Cut like a, they said. a promo about how you'd be damned if you let Kurt Angle take what he'd given his life to. Said Kurt thought this was going to be a great swan song, but he was mistaken. He he said that Kurt held what he desired and he'd give anything for his career, his life, blah, blah, blah. Said he never touched him at impact because he wanted to be the very best so that after he beat him tonight, Angle would look up and know that Joe was the world heavyweight champion. This ruled. Joe ruled. Lauren was terrible. Uh, Lauren... Is that her name? Lauren, yes. I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I took note because Mike Tanay said, let's go to our new backstage correspondent, Lauren. And that was it. And then, and then I remember because she was so bad because she tried to explain Joe's retirement steps, and this took her about eight minutes to do. Yeah. So then we had, what do we have next? Oh, the Kip James, BG James deal. And first they did a promo, which I don't even understand. I think Kip said that he was going to feed BG to Lions after he beat him. <laughs> if that's not what he said, do not correct me. I just want to always remember that he said he was going to feed him to lions. He said something comparing himself to a big cat or something, and suddenly he was staying next to a tiger cage. This is a great idea on paper, because you, cause you're comparing Kip James to a vicious jungle, jungle killer. It failed in execution because the tiger did not hit its spots. Yeah. The tiger did not roar. The tiger, it sounded to me like the tiger actually mooed like a cow, and then it just sort of paced around lazily. So this tiger had poor work rate and needs to go. Kip James and BG James, a star and a half. It was just a basic match. In fact, it was so old school. <laughs> it, it was. A, it started a Tim Flowers match. Kip just beat him from the opening bell forever, and then BG made a big comeback and threw him in all the sides of the cage. And then uh, Kip ended up uh, going for a stinger splash, and BG just moved and rolled him up for the pin. It was so wacky. Uh, and then afterwards, of course, he did the big swerve, supposedly, where Kip wanted a handshake, and uh, or BG wanted a handshake, uh, handshake. Kip shook, and then, of course, gave him a clothesline. And apparently Vince Russo was there and, and uh, had a mighty grin on his face during the swerve, like he'd fooled everybody, even though there wasn't a single fucking person in the building that didn't know this was coming. What a geek. I enjoyed this probably more than anyone else. Uh, this, it, was, it wasn't great, but maybe just the, my expectations were lower. But they basically stole the match layout from uh, Eddie Guerrero and Brock Lesnar, which is a fine idea, with the exception that these are not Eddie Guerrero and Brock Lesnar, they're BG and Kip James. But the story still worked, because Kip sucker sucker punched BG at the bell, and BG was out, and then for the next ten minutes, BG did not hit two moves in a row. He got his ass kicked, he might hit a reversal and an elbow at at some point, but he would immediately get cut off, and it was so basic that when he finally made his big comeback, everyone went into it. And I thought, yay, yay wrestling! And then it is just, just a simple finish. BC won the roll up. This feud must continue. Fine. I had nothing to complain about here. No, nothing bad. Just wasn't better in start and a half. Borash interviewed Angle. Said before he came to TNA, he was in the WWE, and anybody they threw his way, he beat, made them tap. And then he started watching the competition. He saw a man, Samoa Joe, who wasn't just a wrestler, he was an animal. 
said that it was an intensity that he only saw in one other place, and that was in the mirror. He said uh, Joe took Angle to the limit in all those matches, gave him everything that he had, and tonight he had to do something drastic because he wanted. Uh, they both wanted one thing, and only one of them could have it. He said he was going to tap Joe out. He said he needed to beat him and end his career. And it wasn't about winning or losing tonight. It was about survival. And all I have... This was awesome. So I throw that in there. All I have to ask is, why was this promo and the Joe promo not what closed out Impact this past week? Well, I don't know. Why did they do these awesome promos on a fucking show I already paid for? Indeed. The point of a pre-match promo or a, a promo such as this, is to compel people to pay money to see the battle. Everybody had already paid their money to see this fucking battle when they aired this this promo. So, note to TNA. Instead of doing that stupid-ass music video package, or if you still want to do that, fine. But if you've got two guys that can cut promos like this for your fucking main event, that is what should close out impact. So the show ends and people, the, the show ends and people think, I must see this fight. I must pay for this fight. I must see this on Sunday. Not, I've already bought it. I can't wait. Yeah, the ironic thing there is that they are called promos, which is short for promote or promotion. Yes. They are used to promote your your product. Yes. And, and TNA has found a new use for them, which is to kill time. Then we had the 16 Cuffs 25 Geeks bullshit match with Machine Guns, LAX, Steiner, and PD. Rock and Rave, Eric Young and Kaz, Black Raid and Relic. They beat up Eric Young backstage, so he didn't come out. And Kaz, the babyface, had to be forced into the cage. That was a good one. So there were just 12 guys or whatever all in a cage hitting each other. It was lame. Uh, there were a bunch of moves, which I guess were fine. And guys were getting handcuffed to the cage. And came down to Rock and Rave versus the Monsters. And then Super Eric came out. And uh, handcuffed Hoyt and Rave to the cage. And then the monsters tried to handcuff him to the cage, but he used his superpowers to cuff Relic. And then he hit DVD on Rain and cuffed him and won. And uh, here's my question. I gave this a star and a half. I was probably being generous. I would say so. Here's my question. Why would you do the handcuff-breaking gimmick on Impact? Would it would have got a gigantic pop here. If all these guys were getting handcuffed, and it came down to the Monsters and Rock and Rave, Eric Young ran out, he handcuffed the, uh, or maybe he handcuffed one of them, I don't know, but, but the Monsters overwhelmed him, or maybe four on, four on one they overwhelmed him, they handcuffed him to the cage, everybody's sad that he failed, and then he fucking breaks free, runs wild, and wins. That is a much better story. Instead, they handcuffed him on impact, and he just broke free. <laughs> Killing the gimmick. Killing the gimmick. Rather than putting it over. Sure, and uh, I, I don't understand that. that well, I don't This either. was an example. This was an example. I can say as a, as a fair and unbiased man that while this was a great pay-per-view, this was dumb bullshit. This was a... And this sucked. <laughs> sucked. It was a complete clusterfuck. It was... I don't give a fuck if your gimmick is that you love TNA like Crumbly. You must admit that this sucked, or you are a liar. And a fool. And a fool. Yes. The the thing about multiple man matches when you get a bunch of guys in the ring and they can't do stuff, the idea is, like in a battle royal, they get eliminated, and towards the end, guys can do stuff. But A, there was a cage, and B, everyone was handcuffed to it. So even when it was down to two guys, there were still a million dudes, and they're all in each other's way. This is just a clusterfuck from beginning to end. It, uh, there were some giant moves. Kaz, in particular, took an enormous choke slam off the top rope from Hoyt, which is terrifying. But uh, the the... I'm stunned no one got hurt during this. The most blatant example, uh, Young threw Hoyt into the cage and in case of this giant bump and bounced on the ropes and came down, and he almost landed on Jimmy Ray's foot, which would have been a broken foot for sure. Just bad times, but thankfully everything worked out. So it was what it was. The crowd loved Super Eric, and I'm done with it. We had the generic blonde interviewing Samoa Joe's family. Like, they claimed this was his real family, not just random Samoans that they claim is his family in the past. We had Samoa Pete... His father, Samoa Stefan, and Samoan Wayne. This is Joe's family. Pete, Stefan, and Wayne. And their brother Joe. And they're interviewed by Lauren. What the fuck? They're not that Samoan. They were in full Samoan regalia. They don't have Samoan titles. 
Mei Mei. You don't have Samoan names. What's a Samoan name? Umaga. <laughs> oh, that was the most racist thing you've ever said, Vince. Offa. I'm fucking half Mexican. My name's Brian. And your nephew's names are Carlos. Or one of his names is Carlos. <laughs> and one of his names is Cliff. Well, Clifford. He's the white nephew. He's, he's fucking... I know, I know. Settle Jesus down. Jesus Christ. Pete, Stefan, and Wayne. So they said that Joe would win. Then we had Awesome Kong and Raisha Saeed against Gail Kim and ODB. I gave this three stars. People will be appalled, but I thought this was a good match. They uh, It was a debut of Saeed, who had to wrestle in her gimmick, which was a, a sad thing, because she's actually a really good wrestler, but her goddamn mask kept getting in the way. And they claimed she had trained in the dojos of Japan with Kong. And she was such a great wrestler with Kong. They were so great together that... I had, I had pushed for the idea of, of Kong beating a few heavyweights here and there, heavyweight males. I would be fine with with, uh, with uh, Saeed and Kong beating some tag teams, some male tag teams, especially the, the uh, Rock and Rave style geek. That would be fine. Just, they were really good, and, and Gail was a great baby face in peril. She worked almost the entire match. And then ODB made a big comeback, and everybody loved it. And finish was was uh, Saeed, or this was near the finish. Saeed went for a, a top rope power bomb, and Gail turned it into a super Frankensteiner. And then ODB was uh, being held, and uh, uh, Kong tried to hit her with a back fist, but she hit her own partner instead. And then ODB hit a splash off the top for the pin. A fun match. This was a fun match. I had not seen right. Just Saeed wrestle before. Uh, she's really good, and I'm aware, as you noticed, she's a also a. a uh, an attractive young lady, and it's amusing to me. They took this woman and they put her in a mask and, and covered her head to toe and said, "Don't wrestle." <laughs> Meanwhile, I have to watch Team Prawn yes. and, and God bless her, Tracy Book Brooks. But even in this match, even even in her wacky getup, she had to wrestle. And I was like, "She's real good, and I want to see her wrestle more." Yeah. And uh, I did not like the match as much as you did. I thought it was good when they had the heat on Gale. Once ODB got a hot tag, I thought the match as a whole broke down. I'm not blaming ODB for that. I think I thought it was just kind of. Awkward and clumsy for a bit there. And then there was the big finish that was fine. So this is also a thumbs up. Karen backstage with Borash. She said, notwithstanding their broken relationship, she was there to support her husband. So the match had changed his entire life, and she was very concerned about what would happen if he didn't win. Like he might get back on pills. And uh, back. She's very concerned, Borash said. There you go. Because no one does drugs in TNA. No, that was, that was allegedly. Come on. Sarcasm. Now. But uh, th- this, in fact, was a swerve. Because it made me think for certain that she was going to interfere in the main event. Yeah. So, he swerved me. Booker T and Charmel against Robert Roode and Peyton. The dudes worked almost the entire match, so it was pretty good. And finally, at the end, Tra- uh, Charmel tagged herself in and started slapping the crap out of Roode. So, he grabbed her and was about to go to work when Peyton tagged in. And I'm not sure what happened, but somehow she turned around and accidentally slapped Roode. And then Charmel rolled up uh, Peyton for the pin. And Rude was so angry afterwards that he uh, he didn't even beat up the baby faces. He just stood there and scowled and then went nuts on Peyton and bailed on her. And as he bailed, they played his music. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was making his exit, you see. There was some good wrestling in this the, the, Yes, the, it was basically a singles match with a finish involving women. And it's Robert Rude and Booker T. So you're, unless they're out of their minds, it's guaranteed three plus stars. So it was fine. And they did a wacky little finish, which... Looked bad because you being TNA, I, I believe Charmel did a nut shot on Rude and it's TNA, so I wasn't sure and I missed it. But uh, yes, as noted, Peyton turned around and Robert was staying there and then she just slapped him. That was actually the other problem with that stupid handcuff match. There was so much shit going on that none of the announcers had any no. idea what was going on. They openly apologized for not being able to tell what was going on. Alex Shelley was shown on screen earlier in the match and it was Alex Shelley. He was handcuffed to the cage. There was nothing else on the screen at that time. Two minutes later, Don West is like, oh, look, Shelly's handcuffed to the cage. Yeah. <laughs> There's just too much crap going on. We had Marcus Davis of UFC, who they actually said this time was from UFC, talking about the Joe match and talked about the unbelievable training camp that Joe had gone through, two sessions to three sessions a day, covered all aspects, stand-up, grappling, ground and pound, etc. Said Joe came out of it a complete fighter, and at which point the generic blonde said, nice. Yes, this... I, I don't know. I didn't, I, I didn't write down anything about this. It was just a promo. Team Cage, Christian, Nash, Rhino, Sting, Morgan against Team Tomko. 
Tomco, AJ, Team 3D, and uh, James Storm. War Games, go ahead, Vince. Okay. <laughs> We've been over this a thousand times, but I see you have to go over it one more time. Here's the deal with War Games. You start with two guys. The baby face beats up the heel for five minutes. Then another heel comes in, and they get the advantage of the baby face. They beat him up for two. Then at two minutes, not before, at two minutes, another baby face comes in to even the odds, and the baby faces win. And you repeat this until everyone is in the cage. It's very simple. It's very easy. It will work every single time. Clearly, no one in TNA is aware of this. Match began. Christian came out first. He's in the ring. Tomko's music played. He came down the ramp. He's about to get in the ring. When the lights came up, and suddenly AJ Styles is in the ring behind Christian. He jumps him from behind. Okay. Wacky finish, or excuse me, wacky beginning. Uh, wacky spot to start out. But I'm sure Christian will eventually cut him off and take, o- take over. And uh, finally he did. It took a long time. AJ controlled the first five, most of the first five minutes, including at one point hitting a chin lock. Yes, a chin lock in war games. That is no buys. But Christian had him by the end, and he was in control, and the clock was ticking down, and there was about 15 to 10 sec- 10 to 15 seconds left, and AJ dropped Christian with the Pele kick. Took over on his own. Didn't need help. Didn't need no help from nobody. Brother Ray comes out. They open the door for him. He looks. AJ is standing there. Chris was laying down, and I thought, why even get in the ring? Your partner is doing fine. <laughs> you can serve no purpose here. So he got in the ring, and to their credit, they beat up Christian for two minutes. Yeah. Christian got literally nothing. Good. Thumbs up. That's the way it should be. Out comes Rhino to make the save. Rhino hits the ring. He's running wild. He is Christian. He is Brother Ray. He sets up for the gore, and then 30 seconds in, AJ drop kicks him in the face. And hell of a run in, Rhino. Boy, you sure saved the day. What an effective hero you are. So th- there was more of this. <laughs> I have to go th- this, read my entire thing note for note for note. But there were many other mistakes like this. It was driving me crazy. But I could not help but notice the fans in the building didn't care. No one knows anything about war games anymore. No one knows anything about war games. They just saw guys doing cool stuff, and they were into it. So there was no story. There was no cluster. Uh, there was no flow. There was just a bunch of guys doing stuff, but the crowd enjoyed it. So whatever. So basically, after all the dudes got in the ring, they uh, they actually did one good spot where it was supposed to be the same number of baby faces and the same number of heels. So a baby face ran in to even the odds. But then Christian got sent outside, so it was still uneven. And I thought, brilliant! You've done something right! And then, uh, of course, about uh, five seconds later, Christian just dove back into the ring. So anyway, they uh, got all the guys in the ring, and then it was time for the the lid to come down with all the weapons on it, and as the announcer stated, and I quote, every conceivable weapon was on the lid of this cage. Now, when you hear the term every conceivable weapon, that indicates that every weapon that you can conceive of Mm -hmm. is on the top of this cage. First thing I thought of were guns and chainsaws. You're wrong. Neither of these were on there. The conceivable weapons, for those of you wondering, perhaps that are going to make a dictionary... The conceivable weapons in this universe, for historical purposes, tables, chairs, candlesticks, a ladder, trash cans, and trash can lids. Pretty sure that was it. That is every weapon that can be conceived, apparently. So they use these. Why did they? Way too many unprotected chair shots to the head. Uh, uh, not even chair shots. Unprotected shots to the head of every conceivable manner. Big spot was Storm... Christian and AJ ending up on the top of the cage. A ladder was up there, you see. They set it up on the fucking edge of the cage. Christian and AJ began climbing this goddamn ladder on the edge of the cage, and there was nothing down below. If if somebody would have fallen off this ladder, they would have died. Mm -hmm. No big deal. No big deal. Just climbed it and were fucking around up there, and and, uh, finally it got tipped over, and they both fell through a table, but... That was one goddamn scary and way too dangerous spot. The place went nuts for it, however. And the finish saw Storm breaking a beer bottle over Morgan's head. And then Rhino gored him out of his boots for the pin. Kind of an anticlimactic finish to the the match, considering all the craziness we'd seen earlier. But a very good match. I gave it three and a half stars. I think uh, Dave actually rated it significantly higher than I did. I don't know. He called it spectacular. I don't know if I would go that far. But, it was uh, a spectacle. It was a spectacle. There, It was a spectacular in that manner. Yeah. But I would not consider it spectacular. It, it was, was three and a half stars. The, the first half I hated, the, the, by, the, by the finish, 
it was it was fun. Uh, the, the thing about the big spot is they had Christian laid out on the table, and Storm was helping AJ set up the ladder. I thought, okay, so Storm is going to hold the ladder while AJ climbs off it and hits a frog splash. Cool. I'm fine with this. And then Christian leapt up and nutted Storm, and I thought, oh, God, what are you motherfuckers doing? <laughs> Christian and AJ climbed the ladder. Christian actually teased a Beal off the ladder to the arena floor. Yeah. Which would have resulted in not just any death, but any splash. He would have gone, he would have gone poof like a water balloon. And thankfully that didn't happen, but he teased and weeble wobbled back and forth, and finally Storm went over to, to push them both to the table, which I thought, well, wow, hell of a teammate there. You were just putting your own guy through the table, but, uh, the, the good thing about this was, A, it was set up good because both guys were pulling up, up top, and in the ring, AJ got hold of a stick and just thwacked the hell out of everybody. So the only guy moving in the cage or on top of it was AJ Styles, and the whole crowd watched him go up there, so everyone was focused on that. And then they did the big fucking stupid ladder spot, and then immediately took it home. Storm went down, he hit Morgan with a bottle, turned around, got Gordon pinned. So they, they, they ended, and you, you couldn't have someone get, I don't know if maybe you could get to have someone get pinned on top of the cage, but they ended it as soon as possible after the highest point. Yeah, good. And then we have the main event, Kurt Angle and Joe for the title. This fucking ruled. They had a tale of the tape. They had Frank Trigg doing commentary, and Frank Trigg is awesome. Oh, fuck yes. This guy needs to be added to the commentary booth. He is so spectacular, and this was his second show. He did the live show, and he did this show. He is already better than Don West has ever been in his life. Fuck yeah. And he was in so many ways better than Mike Tanay. And and Tanay actually had a good night. This was the perfect match for Mike Tanay. But Frank Trigg, fucking awesome. Yes, it started off, and we... we We'll get, discuss this in great detail, but it was a very MMA-heavy match at first. Hold on, I'm not even at the match yet. I just want to talk about Trigg. All right, hurry up. He was calling the MMA stuff awesome, and I thought, okay, he's here to do M- MMA stuff. Then when they moved into the big pro wrestling moves, he handled that too. He, he So, yes, he is better than West. He's better than Tanay. He's better than Coach. He's better than Cole. He's better than... I don't know if he's better. He's, he's probably he's better than Taz and Styles. He's better than Lawler. The only guy I like better than Frank Trigg right now is Jim Ross. <laughs> what a team they'd be. Awesome. So, yes, we had the tail of the tape. We had the guys walking into the ring from the locker room, the pre-fight video packages like UFC, mm-hmm. Simone Dancers for the ring intro, Karen in the front row. Angle looked like a fighter. Uh, he had he, MMA shorts on. He had MMA shorts. He had his ankles taped. He had his, his uh, fists taped. He was flanked by two mob-looking dudes. And he came out looking like he was going to have a fucking fight. And this man has been training I mean, you could just tell watching this match that he has been training like a motherfucker for probably not any real fights coming up, but he's been training like he's going to have a real fight. And I hope Joe was actually doing two to three uh, sessions per week because uh, he looked like he was getting tired midway through there, right before the long figure four spot. True, true. And uh, Angle was just a machine. And uh, this was this was the idea that I had for wrestling about a year ago. I thought this is where wrestling is going to go in the future. It's going to start out where the mat wrestling is more MMA based, and then you move on to the high spots and the actual pro wrestling and the near falls there at the end. And that is exactly what this was. And and my idea that everybody everybody that is going to be a professional wrestler, even though it's fake, should be training like they're training for a real fight. That is what I, I firmly believed, and that is what Kurt Angle did here. That is what they did here in this match. It was it was very MMA based early on and and uh, pretty solid all things considered. There were there were holes in it as you'll always find when guys aren't actually doing MMA fighting. But but all things considered, you would have to be a a huge MMA fan to notice these holes or somebody that's trained it. And it doesn't matter because it's fake pro wrestling and everybody knows what it is. But they worked very hard early doing the MMA style: the kicks, the punches, the guard, the submission attempts, the rope breaks. They worked this. They didn't work this like a UFC fight, because the rules, obviously, in pro wrestling are different. They worked this like it was two pro wrestlers that were going to have a shoot pro wrestling match. That obviously means a little bit of MMA groundwork. That means rope breaks, if you're close enough to the ropes. That means a suplex here or there, a... a, uh, a uh, an overhead suplex, uh, Kurt threw in there. Some pro wrestling style submissions, like a figure four, which would hurt like a motherfucker, but you're never getting that on anybody in a real fight. And uh, a bunch of other uh, different spots like that. And it started out very MMA based. Then they started moving into the pro wrestling stuff. 
And then it became a pro wrestling match at the end. And finally, Joe threw him headfirst into the cage. The only fucking time that they used the cage in the entire match, he threw him into the cage, he super kicked him, and then he put him on the top rope, and he gave him a muscle buster and got the uh, the uh, clean pin. And uh, it was fabulous. This was a fabulous fucking match. And uh, I could have wept at how great it was. Two thumbs up. I gave it, uh, I didn't actually give it a star rating. I'm going to have to think, of, I'm going to watch it again, but it was high in the four stars in yes. this particular match. Yes. I would, so far it's easily the match of the year. It started off, as you noted, the, the, the it was a, a, like a shoot pro wrestling match because you guys couldn't stay in the guard for too long because your shoulders are down. Yeah. So they had to kick out of that. There were plenty of rope breaks because that's legal. And, uh, Trig, even late in the match, Angle was in the choke, and he used he grabbed the ref and he used the ref to pull himself to the ropes. And Tr- Triggs just pointed out, "Hey, great idea!" And Nate tried to chastise him. That's cowardly. That's bad tactics. And Triggs was like, "What? It got on the ropes. It, it's fine." But uh, there, early on, Joe a couple times hit the ropes, and it always backfired. He always ran into a throw or into a clothesline or into a, a kick or something. So the point of this was. MMA is beating pro wrestling early. And then by the end, when it was time for the big moves, there were power bam, power bombs and slams and chop battles, and it was great. And I was watching the whole thing thinking, this is my favorite match I've seen all year by a wide margin, and I just know it's going to get fucked up when Karen Angle's going to run in, like every other TNA main event ever. And I, I wasn't willing to let myself get hooked into the match because I knew I'd be, it would be taken away from me at the end. And then Joe pinned him, and I screamed, holy shit! Joe pinned him. And I thought, wow, that was the match of the year. So, yes, this was awesome. Get the replay. Get the DVD. Watch it over and over again and bask in the glory. This match ruled. I sent this on Observer Live, and I think I sent it when we were talking about Impact, but Samoa Joe should have won the title like a year ago. When they when they first did this feud and they had the three matches and, and Joe lost all three, I believe it was, or no, he won the second one, and he lost the first and third. He really should have won the title in that third match. Did he win the second match? I believe it went. I believe it went. Kurt, Joe, Kurt, Kurt. How did Joe not win the title in the second match then? Kurt wasn't champion then. Oh, that explains it. But anyway, Joe should have won the title a year ago, preferably in that, that third match with Angle or the second match or whatever it was. That was a time when he was at his hottest. And an angle had been portrayed largely as a geek for a long, long time. And it was only very, very recently that they started pushing him as a, as a real main eventer. And, and I, I was just, I was watching the build up to this and I was even watching the match. And I just, I, I, God bless Samoa Joe. I love Samoa Joe, but angles should be the champion of TNA. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Um... It now is not Joe's time. Joe's time was a year ago. And maybe there will come a point where, where it's his time again. But th- it really has come off in the last several weeks like this is Kurt Angle's time. This is the guy, this is, this is almost that old school where everybody in the company is a geek, but this is the fucking guy that, that is leagues above everybody else. And if you had to take a guy in your company and have him represent you elsewhere in the world in another form of combat, or, or if you had to send one guy to WWE in a dream match or whatever to face our champion, who would you fucking send? Kurt Angle! He's great. He's, He's that, fucking great. And I, I was talking earlier about opinions and, and how I cannot respect people's opinions. Anybody who tells me with a straight face that Kurt Angle is no good, fuck you. Fool! I have no respect for your opinion, Okay. You don't have to say that he's the best wrestler in the world or, or anything like that, but to tell me that Kurt Angle is no good, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about. This man is fucking phenomenal. Phenomenal. And he was in the best shape I think that he's been in in years and years and years and years. He came into this match looking like he could wrestle for two hours at a good clip and not get tired. This guy fucking took this so seriously. Mm-hmm. A fake fight! He took this so seriously, and he was the man this evening. He was the man. Like, this this was the match where Joe won the title. It was his night and everything like that. God bless Joe, but this was Kurt's match. He was the fucking man here. And uh, I don't know where they go with him. I hope they continue on this on this road. Uh, Kurt, Kurt Angle is the comedy geek. is funny. God damn, he's funny. But he is so much more effective in this role, 
and uh, and I, I really think the show's doing 30,000 buys, and I'm very happy that it's doing 30,000 buys because those people saw a goddamn good show. Maybe they can do it so that uh, th- this loss motivates him. Could be. And he rebuilds himself as a serious ass kicker, and then he goes on to kill everyone. Just come on and just kill everybody week after week for six months, and then do another match with uh, match with Joe, and and we'll see what happens there. But uh, Joe versus Steiner in May should be pretty damn fun. I think that'll be an exciting little match right there if if Steiner has the uh, cardio to to go any length of time. So that appears to be where they're going right now. But just a fantastic match, just a great great match. And and that really made this pay per view. So you know, we talk about how all thumbs up, fingers we, toes, yes, you know. yeah, all body parts up. We talk about how when you're selling a pay per view, only the main event matters. That's what people buy it for. And just by that, this pay per view has to be a giant success. It is. What more could you want? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> Apparently, some people have some ideas, but I I I, I don't know what you could do. Uh, this was just great. And and it was you know you you can forget all that stupidity on the undercard when you have a match this great. You have you have main yeah. eventers that that do the main event matches and have the main event feuds. They sell the pay per views. They're the ones that you treat seriously. And it doesn't matter if everybody else is a geek. Yeah. It totally doesn't matter. Those of you when you think about WWE during the boom period, and uh, and and how great it was, people reminisce. There was some shit. There was some utter shit in WWE during the glory period. You just had awesome fucking main events on every show. That's what people remembered. Right there again, was some wh- horrible stuff. Wh- which time frame we're talking about here? The whole late 90s. Okay, then yes. You had the Godwins. You had the Headbangers. You had all that crap. But it didn't matter because you had the, you had you the had Adam Austins Baum. and the Rocks and yes. everybody on top, and that's that's what mattered. You know, the, the, old, the, the It's kind of getting sidetracked here, but... I remember when there was a WCW video game, and then they sold the license, and WWF came out with their version. Same game, but their roster. We were all excited. Yes, we finally get to watch the play the this game with our favorite guys. And once you got past the Austins and the Undertakers and the DXs, there was nothing on that game. No. Their roster sucked outside of the top. Yeah. So anyway, thumbs up. <laughs> As everybody's aware, I am not a man to bury our subscribers. I, of course, love all of our subscribers and very appreciative of them. But we do have a small handful who are, in fact, mental midgets. Now, there have in the past been grave complaints about our TNA reports. People angry that we say the same stuff every single week. Brian, why do you always say the same stuff? We hear the same rant week after week after week. Why do you watch the show? Just stop watching it. I don't want to hear it. All right. Listen. Press stop now. Are you saying you don't have anything good to say about Impact? No, I'm just saying that's all you have to do. Why would you? Why would we have a huge thread about how I should stop reviewing a show because I say the same things every week when you, the listener can merely hit the stop button now. I think we should stop reviewing the show because it sucks. I don't want to watch it anymore. We have talked about everything else we're going to talk about. The only other thing we're going to talk about today is impact. So, if you don't want to hear it, press stop now. Easy. Now. Are they gone? I believe so. Let's talk about Iron Ring. I don't hear them right now. All right, let's talk about TNA Impact. If you're still listening, by the way, if you're still listening, stop. Really, all of you. Even if you like the TNA Impact, stop listening. What's wrong with you? (laughs) If you don't like listening to this, why are you still listening right now? Are you a glutton for punishment? Are you a, a, do you cut yourself? What is it? Perhaps they're addicted. They they, they cannot turn the, the audio off. It could be. Do we need to implement an ignore feature on this radio program? He should block her down when he access. Well, no. So you listen to it, and it, 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 your your iPod ignores the TNA references. Can we somehow work that in? Talk to Tony, see if he can pull that off. Perhaps that would make it easier for those of you that do not have the willpower to hit the button that reads stop. It is usually round and red, or a square. God, you're an angry little man. <laughs> Idiots. Round and red is usually record, isn't it? 
It is, actually. I was looking at the wrong It's usually button. a green square. It's usually a square, everybody. The one that is a square. Four sides. Although, if you do hit record, you just record over the TNA part. That works, too. Could be. So, let's talk about this. They recap lockdown, which fucking ruled. And if that statement makes you mad again, hit the stop button. Well, when you say it fucking ruled, it ruled when they recapped the Joe Angle match. For the rest of this, it was totally useless. I watched the show and I had no idea what was going on in this recap. Sure. I was just talking about the, the main event was great. The main event recap was awesome. No, the main event was great. Oh, the main event of the show. Sure. I no, see. the main event of the pay-per-view. Right, that's right. Who yeah. cares about the recap? This was called the Revenge of Lockdown. Yes. <laughs> not revenge from lockdown. Not revenge at lockdown. The revenge of lockdown. Yeah. Apparently a six-sided cage was going to come out and attack people who had wronged it in the past. <laughs> they could put that against the fence. <laughs> There's a there's a main event on any the revenge pay-per-view. of lockdown. Samoa Joe came out with the championship. There's a fat guy in the crowd. We couldn't stop looking at it. I'd like to add. And uh, well, the best part was he was enormously fat and chose to wear a, the the smallest shirt they would have let him into the impact zone with. Yeah. So anyway, he he talked about the match, put over Kurt, said he was he was the baddest man he'd ever been in the ring with. Five people clapped. He. Uh, he talked about this, that, and the other thing. Talked about how Orlando was where dreams come true. At which point, this was utter shit. He was lying. Just a liar. So Steiner, Petey, and Rocket Khan came out, and we got a the usual fantastic Steiner promo about how he was going to kick Joe's fat ass at the pay-per-view. Fat ass, that's what he said. He said that... Uh, he was a, a uh, he was a, he had sacrificed his entire career, uh, Steiner said. He worked his ass off, and that's why he'd gotten a cowler ship, and that's why he was a genetic freak. That's right. If you work hard, you can also have good genetics. Right. That's the lesson to be learned from Scott Steiner. So, he said Petey had also made sacrifices, and so he was going to give him the X Division briefcase, and the people booed. And, uh, the very same X Division title shot that Scott had worked so hard to take from PD in the first place. That's right. And then he said that he was going to get his title shot, of course, at the pay per view. And, and out came Kurt and talked about this and that. And anyway, next week for free, it is going to be Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe on Impact on a show that is going to get a 1.1 rating, if they're lucky. And, and Kurt actually pointed out this is going to be for free. For free. Yeah. He made it clear this is going to be for free, everyone. We are not profiting. It is a baffling thing that a company that was so great on Sunday is, again, so awful today. I don't know what these people are thinking, and I don't care. There was a point here early in Joe's promo. Joe's promo was basically very good, except for the Orlando line. And there was another point where he said, when I was in that ankle lock and I heard felt my sinew snapping, I was threatened to tap out, but I was inspired by the fans, and I didn't do it. I thought, well, that's great, Joe, but if your sinew snaps, you're walking around pretty good. You don't seem too hurt at all by that. His sinews did not snap, Vince. He was lying to me. He was telling a fib. Rhino and Christian cut a promo about how they've been through hell together. Now we're friends. Up came Team 3D. A bunch of blah, blah occurred, leading to a six-man later. There you go. They called Rhino Terry. A strange noise just came from the living room. <laughs> but uh, They called Rhino Terry, and then it ended with five heels attacking two guys. That's always good when, when the baby faces are, in fact, outnumbered. All right, Brian's going to go investigate what's happening. Hopefully he's not attacked by clowns, which is what it sounded like was out there. Okay. Up next there was, and I'm quoting here from my own notes, bullshit with Jay Lethal, SoCal Val, Sanjay, and Jeremy Borash. I believe this involved Lethal getting ready for his match and finding out Sanjay and SoCal Val were alone in the ladies' room together. Then Jay left the Val because his match was next. Borash said, told Sanjay he knew he was up to something, and Sanjay said they were just talking and Borat pointed out they were in the ladies' room, and Sanjay thought this was normal, and this all just sucked. This angle blows. This is just no good and no buzz whatsoever. Are there clowns out there? <laughs> There's a... I don't know. <laughs> no emergency, though? Everything's cool. Okay, good. That was rather odd. <laughs> did, you, did you solve the mystery? Did you know where the noise came from? I did. Okay. What were we talking about? Bullshit with Jay Lethal and SoCal Valley. Who gives a shit? Okay. All right. Then we had Jay Lethal and Johnny Devine. Did we have a thing with... Oh, yeah, we did. You talked about that. Yeah, Jay Lethal and Johnny Devine had a match, and uh, I believe Jay Lethal won with the flying elbow. And then Petey immediately came out and uh, beat the crap out of him, put his head in the briefcase and stomped on it, 
and then hit the Canadian destroyer for the pin, cashed in his his uh, money in the bank briefcase, and there you go. He's the new X Division champion. So yes, for those of you that uh, that were wondering how they were going to further bury Jay Lethal, <laughs> as we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, well, this was how they did. They took the title off of him. So well, thank God for that, by the way. I I just again I am baffled. <laughs> why they bothered to put him over so strong and then spend the next. Why Two do months you, burying him? Why do you put the man over so damn strong and then bury him so damn deep below the earth? Just jackasses. I don't get it. The match, the first match though was fine. It was it was Johnny Devine versus Jay Lethal in a no commercials match. That, yeah. was, that was the step. Yeah. There will be no commercials during this match, and it was very simple. Devine won on Jay, and then Jay won on Devine and pinned him. There were not eight million near falls. There was no. Complicated back and forth. There was no run-in. Just two guys having a match, and then one guy won, and it made me very happy. You know, somebody on the board made a comment about the new generic blonde chick, and they were like, Brian said she was really bad, but I watched it, and I'm not sure what was so bad about her. Well, let me explain here, for example. She interviewed LAX. They said they were going to win the world titles and conquer the world. And then Salinas began burying her, and I guess challenging to her fight, and the blonde just laughed the whole time. Yeah. This is bad, everybody. She, she, this is bullshit. She, she uh, made LAX a totally fake, basically. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was no good. It's like that time that Caden didn't smart up the, the people that ran the Boys and Girls Club, and so the Suicide Kings were trying to run him down, and the, the, the woman just fucking cut a promo on... on uh, <laughs> buried Del Sol and Del Sol, and he backed down. Like he was afraid she was going to beat the shit out of him. Well, she might have. This does not work, everybody. You may find it funny, but it's bad. So then we had Matt Morgan coming out and cutting a promo about how Cornette had been like a father figure to him and taught him that timing was everything and his time was now and uh, he was going to make his mark on the business. Long story short, nobody cared, so he even left. Brian promo, he talks too fast, but I guess it's impact that's important because guys only have 30 seconds at a time. But yeah, this uh, I guess I had a point, but I don't, it didn't want to work. You know, everybody's always talked about what a great promo Matt Morgan is and. I don't really find him all that great. He's okay. You know? I, I mean, what what is good about it? That he doesn't mess up his words? He doesn't mumble? That he enunciates? Yeah. That does not make a good promo. <laughs> that means he's 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 a fine speaker. That's what he a, is. As a promo, when you go out there and you cut a promo about how you're 7 feet tall and 320 pounds and now is your time and you're going to fucking run roughshod over the company and everybody in the audience just sits there and looks at you, failure. Not a good promo. I don't know what uh, the deal is with Morgan. Joe did a promo. Yes, two in one hour. Yeah. (laughs) He's talking about sacrifice and all this, and suddenly Nash just rose up behind him like the Loch Ness Monster coming out of the sea. And he looked at Joe as Joe spoke, and then Joe just left, and that was the end. Well, the best part was Joe leaving, and when he stepped away from Nash, we got a clear view of Nash's T-shirt, which was black with white letters that read, and I quote, Nash, <laughs> that's it. Well, good. I was confused about who the seven-foot man might be, but now I know. That guy right there, that's Nash. AJ and Tomko versus Super Eric and Kaz versus LAX for the tag titles. Basically, of course, uh, Eric Young left during this match, came back out as Super Eric, and won the match. And at that point, we cut to commercial when we came back. AJ and Tomko were screaming to Cornette that they had lost due to outside interference. Cornette said, what do you mean? And they said, well, Super Eric ran in. And Cornette said, Super Eric was in the fucking match. And they said, no, Eric Young was in the match. Super Eric ran in. That's a, It's a run-in. It's, a, it's outside interference. Now, I would like to preface this by saying that these angles would work if there wasn't fucking outside interference in every goddamn match that they do. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so Cornette's like, well, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, why don't you ask him if if he's really Super Eric? And if he says no, then that means there was outside interference and we get the belts back. And so Cornette said, fine, get the fuck out of my office. And uh, that was that. So, then we had Team 3D versus Christian and Rhino. Cluster fuck of a finish. This is billed as a grudge match, sure. which all wrestling matches are usually. But uh, this grudge had been developing for, oh, 40 minutes. Ever since that first angle earlier in this show, that's what counts as a grudge match in DNA. Sure. So, there was a low blow behind the ref's back. Rhino tried to gore Bubba, but accidentally hit Christian. Devon then tried to clothesline Rhino, but hit Bubba. Rhino rolled up Bubba for the pin. 
And then afterwards, we had a big tease for a fight between Devon and Bubba, which you know is going to end up being a swerve because they're not breaking that team up. And uh, that was that. Match was okay. Very very formulaic, which is not a bad thing. And, yes, it, le- it led to an angle that no one wants to see and won't happen anyway. And we had Cornette meeting with Eric, asked about the Super Eric deal. Eric claimed he didn't know who Super Eric was. Cornette told him to stop fucking around, said he was going to call him down to the ring later, and he goddamn sure better appear. And suddenly there was Ballyhoo, and the girls were in the locker room screaming, and Cornette went in there and said he was sick and tired of all this, said they were all spoiled, said when he was breaking in, you had to drive 500 miles each way, six to a car, and in the winter the heater didn't work, and he said it was time for sacrifices, there were going to be changes made, and they were all spoiled brats. And I sat there and I thought, what? This was the worst segment of all time. Between Eric Young being stupid and the whole wacky Eric versus Super Eric angle, then the, the constant screaming, noisy harpies in the locker room, and the complete lack of any storyline here. We, we, this is the storyline where we missed the first half of, this book, half of the story. Yeah, we, we did not see the women being spoiled. This, this, this had to be something where the women were being annoying backstage, and so they booked this angle, and yet nobody knows what the actual story backstage is. This made absolutely no sense. Have you been watching this show week after week, and it's just the girls coming out and fighting their asses off? I have not seen them whining about anything. No. And now all of a sudden it's this big storyline and changes must be made. This was so retarded. This show sucks. Cornette was in the ring after commercial with AJ and Tomko. Said, and I quote, and I quote, and I want to drop it this, somebody, please. He said, I want to apologize ahead of time to all the TNA fans for all of the stupidity going on on this television program. That was the exact words that came out of his mouth. With passion, he said this. <laughs> and I would like to note that when he said, and I quote, I want to apologize ahead of time to all the TNA fans for all of the stupidity going on on this television program, everybody cheered. <laughs> they, they thanked him for his apology and let him know it was appreciated and necessary. Demanded Eric Young come out and reveal his true identity. So Kaz came out with the belts, and then finally uh, Super Eric appeared and refused to reveal that he was Eric Young. And Cornette said, listen, don't fuck this up. I don't want to have to do this. And Super Eric had it, said he had no idea. And so Cornette said, fine, Eric and Kaz, you were stripped of the titles. And the heels began to celebrate and grab the belts, and Cornette said, no, 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 no. I only said that uh, they were no longer champions. I did not say that you regained the belts or anything of that nature. Basically, he said that, the belts were now held up, and he would decide what to do next week. No champions were named. There was no resolution. This is just Kaz thinking Super Eric was stupid. The heels thinking Super Eric was stupid. Super Eric denying that he knew who Eric Young was. Meanwhile, it says on his chest in big letters, E-Y. <laughs> what a terrible baby face. I just figured somebody had to have watched, like, ECW and saw him kill Miz and Morrison and thought, how can we kill our belts more? <laughs> I've got an idea. Well, if that was their goal, they found an amazingly creative way. This would, I would not have thought of this. No. This this takes too much. A, a man winning them and then surrendering, surrendering them rather than admit he is who we all know. And by the way, this is not like when Dusty Rhodes was the Midnight Rider and was facing suspension if he wrestled or had been suspended and he could be punished worse. No. If he takes his mask off, we all say, okay, it's Eric Young. Great. It's too bad the mask isn't more obscuring so that they could actually do the gimmick where it, it, it eventually in the end Super Eric and Eric are seen in the same place at the same time. That would be fucking awesome. Yeah, I was going to go the other way where it would be like my gimmick with the uh, the triplets that I always wanted to do. The, the clones. clones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you, you I remember for a month you told everyone you met, i got to find a pair of twins. I wanted, well, I wanted a pair of triplets is what I wanted because the, the whole idea would be there would be a wrestler and he would claim that he had a clone. And he okay. Would, he would think he was the clone. Because I remember his catchphrase would be, he'd come to the ring, he'd take the microphone and declare, I am the clone. That's right. I am the clone. And, and you would, you would always, he would be involved in everything. It would always, it would be the same guy playing the role. So everybody would think, he doesn't have a clone. It's just him playing both parts, like this Eric Young deal. But then eventually it would culminate with, an actual twin coming out. So you would actually see his clone. Yeah. I had this whole convoluted storyline, and, and eventually it actually led to a third guy coming out. So I needed triplets, which I was never going to find. All so. I remember was the, the best part was this was actually the build up to the reveal of guy number two, 
Where the first clone would, everyone of course would say, you're not really a clone, boo, we don't believe you. And he'd say, no, I can prove I'm a clone. Here is photographic evidence of me standing next to my clone. And then he would put up on the big screen a picture of himself standing next to the guy, and the other guy's face would always be obscured. Sure, yeah. A bird would fly by, or a yeah. sign would be in his face, or he'd be wearing a football helmet or something. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, this was just a, this was my finest gimmick of all time. The clone. But they fucked it up here. Awesome Kong and Roxy for the women's title. Oh, we had the BG, Robert Roode, and, and James Storm promo. And, uh. James Storm buried Kip James because the cross chop. First of all, he said the cross chop is old and out of date. And then when Kip got angry about this, James Storm said, just said, you're angry because your cowboy gimmick didn't get over in the 90s. Anyway, this, the, the point of this is that it's TNA, so no matter who's on a team, they always have to have people fighting. Yes. No one can ever get along in this company. There are no friends in TNA. You've got three heels, yet they have to be mad at each other. Just. I remember back in the day when the Four Horsemen would be like, would cut a promo and Arn and Tully would just start yelling at each other about stuff. Oh, wait, that never happened. Like, the whole idea is, is you want to build up two people that don't like each other so that you pay to see them fight, right? This is like the, the bottom line. So why do you more. have people fighting on a team and you have to pay to see them not fight? You have to pay to see them together? That's yeah. retarded. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Roxy and, and Awesome Kong for the women's title. So uh, they had a match, and it was pretty damn good, actually. Roxy was a, a great little baby face. Kong uh, beat the crap out of her as always. Of course, Roxy, I, I said this before on ECW with, with CM Punk. I'll say it again here. There didn't used to be stupid baby faces. Like, if you were stupid, you just weren't a baby face. Because the fans don't get behind stupid baby faces. So what does Roxy fucking Laveau do during this match? Everybody loves her. She's over like a great baby face. She's doing awesome. And she tries to hook Awesome Kong for the voodoo drop. Yeah. Yes, this is a hold that involves supporting your opponent's full weight using basically your own hips and one arm. Yeah. Awesome Kong's big. It's failed. It's did not work. Not only did it fail, but it immediately led to her getting pinned. The, the funniest part is that... Whoever put this match together, fired. There are apparently three people who thought this was a good idea. Roxy, whoever put this match together, and Don West. Because when Don, when the match began, Don West said something along the lines of, Roxy's only hope is to somehow get Awesome Kong in a position where she can hit that voodoo drop. And I thought, What? Not in a thousand years could she hit that move on this beast. Yeah. She's way too big. Then we have the stupidest segment of all time is Angle. The same Kurt Angle that was so tough in training MMA and, and a big badass fighter, he was crying. Crocodile tears. Because he didn't have a locker room. DNA sucks. <laughs> yes, and it's in, in the four days that had passed since he had lost his title, he had turned his locker room into his storage facility. He did not. Apparently, there was lots of stuff that had to be stored. There was lots of paper towels they had around that had to sure. go on a shelf somewhere. Yeah. And Angle did not kick the door down and start throwing things around. He did not choke Jerry Borash into submission. He did not go into Cornette's office and demand his room. No. He wept. He cried like a little girl. This was so. Let me tell you how stupid this was. Number one, it was stupid because Angle was crying like a little girl. Number two, they said that only the champ gets his own dressing room. Boy. This is some fucking high-end entertainment here. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> everyone else is a geek. Fuck. I mean, this all the is... geeks in the other room. Man, you, you know when you go to, to Vegas to see a stage show and only one guy's got a dressing room, everybody else is, like, in the woman's bathroom? Man. So that was fucking stupid. Plus the idea that, okay, if there's only one dressing room, why does it change? Why did they take whatever was apparently in the other storage room and put it in Angle's office and then put a star on the... The other storage room that now has nothing in it. Why didn't they put, just, just put Joe in Kurt's old locker room? Yeah. I, I, have, I have no idea. Did anyone think? <laughs> no. They thought, oh, what can we do to make Kurt cry? We'll take his dressing room away. So dumb. Sting Booker and BG against Kip James and James and Robert Roode. Had a match. Uh, let's see what happened here. Uh, Booker got that tag. Some stuff happened. Booker went for the spinner. This recap rules. Yeah. Well, it's it's like if, if I can't remember this, I, I'd have to read my notes word for word, word for word to remember what happened. So it was a failure. There, there, there was the heat on BG with a backcracker, which is kind of funny. And then uh, there was dueling chance of we want Sting, we want Booker, so who would get the hot tag? The Booker fans won. Now I remember why I don't remember this. There was a ton of stuff going on. No, because it was stupid. Remember? There, oh, I do. I remember the stupidity. Matt Morgan ran in. 
Let's see. Hold on a second. The referee, Booker got the hot tag. He made a sloppy, out-of-control comeback. The referee was distracted by something, and in ran Matthew Morgan. Storm got a beer bottle. Okay. Matt Morgan ran in and hit him with a bicycle kick. Both the referee and Booker T missed the run-in by the seven-foot man. Booker got so mad that Morgan interfered. Not just that he interfered, mind you. This was not mentioned, but he was mad not just because he interfered, but Matt Morgan also saved him from being hit by a beer bottle. Right. He was still mad. He was mad at Morgan and... And... He was so mad that Matt Morgan saved him from being hit by a bottle and helped him win that he challenged Sting to a match next week. That's what happened. (laughs) Booker was mad at Morgan, so he wants to fight Sting. (laughs) I I know I just repeated what you just said, but I had to to repeat it to myself about eight times in a row to make sure I I had it straight. So, Morgan pissed off Booker, and so he's going to wrestle Sting. But we right? got to go backwards. He pissed off Booker T because he saved him from being hit by a beer bottle yes. and kicked the man with the beer bottle. Right. Otherwise, the beer bottle would have broken over Booker T's skull. Sure. So Booker T should be thanking Matt Morgan. But instead he was mad. Okay. And how mad was he? He was so mad that he turned to his right and challenged Sting. <laughs> what? <laughs> and the best part, as always... The announcers had no idea what was going on. Well, okay. as Booker was yelling at Morgan for saving him, Tanae said, well, you can't blame him. Matt Morgan was in the wrong. <laughs> what? <laughs> he well, wrong? you see, he, he interfered in TNA. In a match. He, he interfered in a wrestling match? Oh, no. <laughs> what what travesty has befallen total nonstop action wrestling? The fucking, it's, it's the, the uh, you know. This show is fucking awful. <laughs> Such a bad program. I like this company for a day. I, I just, I just wish like real professional Hollywood writers. I hate to say that because they fuck up everything in WWE, but I wish like a real Hollywood, like a, um, you know, one of those uh, uh, continuity editors. I wish one of them could just get his hands on one of these scripts and just read it with with like a highlighter. I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm tired of it. It's just. It's just I, I can't say I'm tired of it because this is new. This is a new kind of stupidity <laughs> where one man is so angry at the, at the guy who saved him that he challenges a third man. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. This will never make sense. So anyway, is there what is there next week? Booker T and Sting? Booker T and Sting and also Kurt and Joe. Free. Free. 1-1, one, one, everybody. 1-1. One, one. This show got a 1.0. Yeah, it did. It's on the way down. It's on the way down. They've gone from, from 1-2s to 1-0s. And uh, I'm going to laugh next week when it's another 1-0. Fuck you, TNA. I throw that one out there. I shouldn't say that. Fuck you, Impact. Impact, fuck you. You can suck my dick. TNA Impact. Some good wrestling on the show. Angle and Joe was a good match. Didn't think it was nearly as good as a pay-per-view match. The Motor City Machine Guns had a good match when they weren't involved with the commercial break. Uh, The Booker T and and Sting match I thought was good when it wasn't cut off by a commercial break. There was some good stuff on this show, but this pay-per-view coming up. Zero buys. I predicted a lot of buys for Angle and Joe. I was correct. I actually may not have predicted as many as they actually got. They may end up getting like 40,000, 45,000, and I think I predicted 30 or 35 or something like that. There is no way in the world that this pay-per-view is getting more than 18,000 buys. I actually said 15. From watching this show, 15,000 buys. The matches that they're teasing for this show, I cannot imagine a man on the earth wanting to see. We'll get into it as we go along here. Okay, then. I have much to say about this this little program here. It's very frustrating because they did such a good job on the last pay-per-view. And they apparently learned nothing from it. They did such a good job building it up. They did such a good job on the pay-per-view. They apparently did great business for the pay-per-view. The pay-per-view was was very well received, aside from some people that couldn't handle fake MMA in a fake wrestling match. But all of that. And then what do they present two weeks later? This. This shit fest of a television program. The show opened up with, with Matt Morgan attacking Kip James in the hallway and putting the boots to him. 
a babyface sneak attacked a heel and beat him up, which confused me. And then I thought he said something like, "I'm." What did he say? Something like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something here tonight or something." He says they were making a statement, or I, I don't know. All I know is while while he was putting the boots to Kip James, Warren was in the background acting. Oh yes, and that should that should come with a hazard warning. Yeah, should, warning. Lauren is about to act. Brace Kip, yourself. Kip James, by the way, never seen again. Oh, never seen again. <laughs> BG James never seen again after I believe he got clotheslined at the pay per view. A clothesline. I don't even remember. It was an all cage show. A man took a clothesline, and he has now not been seen in two weeks. Angle and Joe were back the next night. So anyway, teased the Angle versus Joe match and and said. This was a match you could only see on pay-per-view, but tonight it was free. These people really thought this was going to do a better number. I predicted a 1-1. Even I ended up a fool. Yes. This did a 1-0. 1.0. There was a period where they were getting like 1.6 million viewers. They're now down to 1.3 million with a rematch of Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe. 1-0, everybody. 1-0. Booker T got a promo. Uh, to explain what happened with Sting at the end of the last show. For those of you that don't remember, I'm not going to even try to recap because it made no sense whatsoever. I, I will summarize in one second. All right. Matt Morgan interfered and hit James Storm. This made Booker T want to wrestle Sting. Yes. Booker T came out to explain this and then didn't explain it. Oh. <laughs> he, he, he decided to be friends with he Sting apologize. again. He apologized. He apologized. Apparently he realized it made no sense. Yeah. And then... And then we had the other two geeks, Robert Roode and James Storm, come out. And James Storm said that the two of them had been friends since the 80s, which I don't recall, and and therefore they should get married on national TV. And then he went, ha, ha, ha. And then Roode said, what my drunk friend is trying to say. My drunk cowboy friend. My drunk cowboy friend. (laughs) Because that was funny. I will give him credit for that. Yes, he said, what my drunk cowboy friend is trying to say is that last week you two teased a fight, and now we want to see it. Which actually is not what his drunk cowboy friend was trying to say. So then Cornette came out and said, I've got a great idea. Somehow He was wrong. Somehow all of this led to this idea. Okay, Recap what happened last week again. Matt Morgan hit James Storm. This made Booker T want to wrestle Sting. In a completely separate incident, the tag team titles were held up. Yes. And then Booker T and Sting got back together, and Rude and Storm said they should fight. This led to Cornette coming up, apparently completely on the fly, with the following idea. A Deuces Wild Tag Team Tournament. Over the next two weeks, eight teams will have matches, and the four winners will go to the pay-per-view. And then at the pay-per-view, there's eight singles wrestlers forming four more tag teams, and it would be completely at random. Some some people would have uh, opponents that they or partners that they liked. Some would have partners that they did not like, and then we'd have um, and then they would have a tournament there, and the winner would become the champions. Did I get that right? As far as I can tell, yes. I hope I make myself clear," said Jim Cornette, <laughs> "and I'm sure we'll have some written material to pass out to you all later on." These were his exact words. <laughs> yes, they were. This is, this is, was this what you're talking about when you said no one would pay money to watch this? No one would pay money to watch it. The pay per view? Yeah. It's just beginning. <laughs> There's more to come. There's way more to come. Yes, this makes no sense at all. It, it, it actually benefits you to be a wrestler with no tag team partner because then you're automatically on the pay per view. The established tag teams have to fight their way onto the pay per view to get into this tournament. Yes. That's bad. So then Cornette signed Rude and Storm versus Booker and Sting for later on. Couple more questions for you. If that's the match that's been built up for two weeks, would it make sense that those teams are in the finals? No, they eliminated one tonight. They also eliminated the Motor City Machine Guns. And okay. <laughs> the whole idea of this tournament is that they want their best tag team to perhaps be a bad team. Yes. They, they're deliberately hoping to get partners fighting as tag team champions. Yeah. I, I don't think that the Sting Booker T match was part of this tournament. I think those four men are going to be among the eight singles guys who are going to be chosen at random to be tag teams in the tournament at the pay per view. The machine guns are out. That is bullshit. Relic and Black Rain against Team 3D. Yes. Two heel teams. And Team 3D, who are hated, worked babyface. So they had a, a decent little match here. Monsters did some stuff. The good guys. 
I guess they're the good guys, hit Relic with the 3D for the pin. And then after teasing breaking up last week, Bubba and Devon shook hands. So apparently they will be on opposite teams at the pay-per-view. Sure. There was a lot to question here. Mike Nave plugged the later match, which he said was between established teams. It would involve the Motor City Machine Guns versus Rhino and Christian Cage. When did Rhino and Christian Cage become an established tag team? They actually said during that match that they were at an advantage because they had not been together. How does that make them an established team? I don't know. Doesn't that make them a disestablished tag team? I, I, a brand new tag team? That's that's A burgeoning tag team? I thought that as well, but uh, that's that's what they told us. So. I thought perhaps it was just me, but no, apparently they were wrong. No. There was more. There was a point in this match where, as Bubba Ray was making, got the hot tag, was making the baby face comeback no one cared about, he had a choke slam on Relic. And he made the cover, North counter one, North counter two, and Relic just barely kicked out. And it was to the point where everyone thought it was the finish, including me, and no one cared because it just looked so lame. And then they just kept wrestling. Yeah. This is an unnecessary and too close near fall. And, and Don West was going nuts like, whoever kicks out of Bubba's choke slam. And I was when like, has Bubba ever choke slammed anyone? Has anyone ever been pinned by that choke slam, Don? So anyway, that was that. Match was, was all right, though. So then. Borash asked AJ about the tag title thing, and he said it's a bunch of crap. And then goes, what are you going to do? So, <laughs> He's glad up. he cares. Yeah. So, they, he said they'd win easy, and then uh, he introduced, uh, he had Karen there, and Borash said this was a terrible, or she said it was a terrible idea, and, and AJ said, you deserve to be here with me. And Kurt, Karen said, Kurt's not going to find out about this, is he? No. No, of course not. Kurt Angle doesn't watch Impact. No. And I, I like even better Borash's reply of, I'm no snitch. How stupid are these people? You know, and even in character. It's bad enough that they're stupid in real life. They're stupid in character. So, like I said, Relic and Rain versus 3D. And then we had another stupid fucking segment that made me angry. The new generic blonde was in the girls' locker room, and she's handing out invitations to all of them. Okay? Handing out all these envelopes. Can I cut you off here? All, all, all I wrote about this segment is, this segment is wretched and unwatchable. <laughs> I don't even remember what happened. All the girls are in the locker room making a lot of noise and being annoying, which is a great way to promote the, the number one rating straw on your program. And the girl is handing out invitations to all of them. The envelopes are, in fact, open. The girls spend about a minute arguing with each other over what the invitations are about. Nobody bothers to read one. Oh, look at me. I told you. It was wretched and unwatchable. When you direct a segment like this, nobody asks that question. Wouldn't one of us just open it? <laughs> and if they do, what's the response? Nobody will think of that. No. Fuck no. So, yeah. Why this would you do that? entire segment went by, and we never found out what the invitations were, even though all the girls had them, and they were all open. Apparently, none of the girls could read. That's the only thing that I can... I can uh, only conclusion I can draw from Perhaps this. Perhaps they were in Japanese. So... Then we had Borash trying to spill the beans to Kurt about Karen, and Kurt refused to listen and cut a promo about Joe, how he'd never lost to the same man twice. Now he's going to defend the belt against Rick Steiner at the pay-per-view. Yes, Rick Steiner, that's what he said. This actually plays into the storyline as, as stupid as it was, and it was stupid. And Borash then told him about Karen, and Kurt freaked out and, and demanded Borash show them where they were at. And Same group that wrote the last month and the pay-per-view wrote this show and i don't understand i just don't get it 1.0 all i know is he kurt referred to steiner as rick steiner and jb corrected him and kurt said whatever yeah i thought wow that's a great way to make your number one contender look like a complete bork oh yeah amazing and, and then yes he kurt was alarmed when he heard karen was there with aj and his response was to order them to leave together yeah that's later on now, today interviewed Eyes of the Gun. Joe, who was doing a training session. Marcus Davis of UFC, perhaps? No, Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash was training Samoa Joe. Yeah. So Nash cut a promo for him, and then Joe said he'd beat Angle tonight and Steiner at sacrifice, and he at least got the right Steiner on this one here. This accomplished nothing. Yeah. They recapped the tag title ADC last week, and, and, uh, and then we had... Eric and Kaz doing a promo where Eric was acting goofy, and Taz, or Kaz said, Don't mind him, he's been hitting the head a lot. Ha ha! Concussions! Hilarity! So, anyway, Eric, uh, Kaz said, Listen, it was 
last week made me mad, but I can't stay mad at you, buddy. Just don't do this again next time. Call Super Eric and tell him not to show up. You know that this whole thing is going to end at the pay-per-view when they do the random draw and Eric Young and Super Eric are booked for the same team? You know that's where it's going. I don't care. Or opposite teams. I, 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 either way. That's that's where they're going with this, and it's going to be dumb. This segment was appalling. I'm not saying it appalling because it offended me with the concussion stuff. It was just so not entertaining yeah. that it appalled me. Christian Goodbyes. Rhino against the Machine Guns. Good match, except for the commercial. Uh, Christian and Shelly did some good mat wrestling early, and then and then uh, the other two did as well, and got the usual mid-match commercial break, worked over Shelly. Saban made a great hot tag. And uh, this was when Don said, Christian and Rhino aren't doing well during this comeback because they aren't established. Those were his exact words. They aren't established. But they're, they are, by definition, an established tag team. Yeah. So, anyway, the, the, the I guess they're the good guys, I don't know, the, the non-established team beat the established team with their finishers. So, uh, yeah, Motor City Machine Guns, geeks. As put out of the tag team tournament by, by, a, by a team that did, couldn't work well together. Think about this. Dude, I, I, I'm all, I don't know. At least they got to wrestle for once. Usually they lose in two minutes. This time they lost in six. That's true. That's true. And, and, and up to the dumb finish, it was good. I, I will note that I liked to think more of the people in the building did, probably because it was all baby faces, but there was like three people trying to start a This Is Awesome chant, and they failed. <laughs> so then a bunch of girls came out, and Cornette said they'd all gotten their invitations, and I guess the invitations were just to come to the ring. He couldn't just say, hey, everybody, come to the ring. So anyway, he signed a TNA Knockout Makeover Battle Royal. Let me repeat that. A TNA Knockout Makeover Battle Royal. Well, what does that mean? This is how it works, he explained. There's an over-the-top rope battle royal with all the chicks. When it comes down to two girls, it becomes a ladder match. Think about that, by the way. Over the ring will be an envelope with a contract in it for a match with Awesome Kong. The winner gets it. And the runner-up, second place, gets her head shaved, you see. That's the makeover. Not the person that gets thrown out of the Battle Royal first. No, no, no. Not the biggest loser. Uh Uh-uh. Not the third biggest loser. No. No. Second place... The silver medalist. ...gets her head shaved. Right. Explain to me why every girl wouldn't just jump out of the ring. That was my question. Why would you even fight in this? And they did this before, actually, with, uh, who was it, Steiner? The Feast or Fire deal. The Feast or Fire deal. Why would you compete in the match? Yes. And, as we noted, Chris Harris didn't. No. He was the only smart one. Yes. Well, uh, your, your, your prize is you're getting a ladder match which in, or, wherein you will get beat up severely, and then you risk having your head shaved or getting beat up by Awesome Kong. Yeah. There's no benefit to winning this Battle Royal. No. You should just leave. Yeah. No buys. Oh my God, no buys. I mean, that's it's it's a cliche now, but this is actually this is the very definition of that term. No buys. Nobody's buying the show. <laughs> a reverse makeover battle royal ladder match with the girls. Woo! A fucking tag team tournament with random geeks making teams together. And you know they're gonna win a lot. And you know that although they're random, it will be all teams that are either established that have been together, or matches where each opponent is on the other team. Booker T O E tag team partners with Robert Roode. Random. What are the odds? There will be nothing random about it. And so we're just supposed to watch and go, wow, the fucking luck of the draw in every match here. Huh. So, Sting and Booker versus Robert Roode and James Storm. They also had a, a fun little match. The highlight was at the finish when Booker tried to hit the ropes and Jackie tripped him. <laughs> All 90 pounds tripped the 240-pound uh, man. Did a stacked-up superplex spot that got the exact same reaction that a DDT had gotten earlier. And then Storm tried to use a beer bottle, but he almost hit his partner. So Rude shoved him. They're already fighting. And then Storm bunked in a sting who gave him the death drop and pinned him. And, uh, yeah, Storm and Rude already hate each other. Of course, yes, partners fighting is what this show's all about. Sting is so underused. He's great, everyone. He's, he's for for his age and as much and, and he's old, but he's still great and people love him. And he's making a ton of money and he's just hanging around here, the mid card doing nothing, yeah. nothing of any value whatsoever. Yeah. I also like the promo beforehand where Booker and Sting were talking about the last time they teamed up, which was to face the Road Warriors in 1996. Yeah. I am not joking. They, Booker said this. Yeah. We teamed up once, 12 years ago. Established team. Good God. I guess this wasn't one of the tag matches, but anyway. So, yeah. 
Kurt ran into AJ and Karen and told him to get the hell out of here, and, and she left with AJ. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I amused myself. My notes for this read, I bet they go fuck. <laughs> what else would they do? This was so dumb. Kurt's like, I don't want you here until I'm done with Joe, and then we can talk about our lives. So then we had Cornette saying he had a, a new idea, a big rolled sheet. And he said... Cornette oh, said he had plans. He had plans. And when I say plans, I don't mean he had ideas in his head. No, he had plans, and he held up his fist. They were blueprints. Blueprints. Design plans. He said that everybody on the show hated him. They were all trying to, to make his life hell. They stole food out of his fridge, blah, blah, blah. He's doing the gimmick where he's losing his mind. It's crazy, Cornette. He stole his strawberries. they got to make fun of him at every possible turn, and this is the latest. So he said he had this blueprint. It was for the next stip match at the pay-per-view. A quote, a monstrous mass of murderous metal. He said they were going to sacrifice bodies, careers, and perhaps lives. And Lawrence said, you sound evil. Evil. He said, no, I'm a good, honest, Christian businessman. Then he cackled, didn't he? He did. I love Jim Cornette. He's it's, it's it's like Angle when he's when he's being a geek. It's like crazy Flair and crazy Vince. I love it. It's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. But what the hell? At least I can laugh at the guy. All you all you can do is just have, try to have fun with it. Yeah. And Cornette, it's clear to me when he was a boy, was a huge comic book fan because he ma, m- murderous mass of metal and mayhem. What was this? Monstrous mass of murderous metal. That is some Stanley dialogue right there. Or it was a cartoon. It was a Bugs Bunny promo here that he did. Then we had Angle versus Joe. After all the bullshit on the show, we got this. They didn't have the balls to even do one MMA spot in this match on national television. They had a traditional pro wrestling match. And it was funny because I read I read some criticism of the pay-per-view match. And they were like, aside from the MMA stuff, it was every Joe Angle match you've ever seen. Please explain to me what the fuck this was. This was every Joe Angle match we have ever seen. And we did not have a clean finish. We had all the usual spots and reversals and that sort of thing, the missed moonsault. And then the referee took a bump, a flare flop. Scott Steiner ran out with a pipe. Angle was run into him, hit with the pipe, I guess. And then Joe hit something resembling a Northern Lights bomb for the pin. Announcers acted completely appalled that a run-in had occurred during a main event. Yeah. So Joe won. He's He's got his belt. And Steiner cut a promo on Angle afterwards saying he... Had better never disrespect him again. Apparently, he's mad that Angle called him Rick Steiner. That's apparently why this whole thing happened. That whole stupid... I didn't even make that connection. That's the whole connection. I didn't realize that until right now. Because just... Angle had called him Rick Steiner, Scott had to come down and cost him the title. <laughs> Scott Steiner is a very proud man. He's proud of being Scott. Never fuck that man's name up. Despite all the times he's fucked up everybody else's name. Don't fuck his name up. So then Cornette came out and, and said, uh, nothing was settled this evening, even though we did have a pin. <laughs> so therefore, he said he was changing the main event at the pay-per-view to Joe versus Angle versus Steiner in a three-way. No buys. Then here's a question. Here's a serious question, though, okay? At least Joe and Steiner, we haven't seen for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And they had a fun match, if I recall correctly. Mm-hmm. What they did here was they took the potential for a new match that we haven't seen in a long, long time. And they gave us another Joe Angle match the day that we saw it for free on television, and it got a one rating. No one's buying the show. 15,000 buys, everybody. That's even, that, that is even worse than the first Joe Angle, which did 60, and the second one did like 40. Here they're going to go from like 40 to 15. That's fascinating there's a point in this match where angle or excuse me joe took a bump over the ropes to the floor and he started selling his knee he was hurt and he was down and they went to commercial and they came back and it was kevin nash giving joe a pep talk yeah because you see the the, the message i got from this was that joe was pondering quitting <laughs> he yeah. was gonna throw in the towel because his leg hurt yes and nash came in and Save the day. Sure. And I thought, boy, that makes Joe look fucking impotent. Yeah. He doesn't look like a coward and a pussy. But Nash saved the day, and Joe fought on, and 
So then Joe goes on to win after after he's in the submission hold and taps out, but there's been a ref bump, and then his opponent is hit in the neck but with a steel pipe by an outside man. Then Joe hits what I think was supposed to be an island driver, and he makes the cover, and the ref counts three as the fans boo. Yeah. What a retarded, dumbass, useless wrestling company. I have not even read the any of the threads on this show, but has there been have there been people saying that this match was better than the pay per view? I have also not read the threads. It's not because I have not had the opportunity, it's because I have chosen not to. I would like people to to uh to email me their explanation if they feel that this match was in fact better than the, the pay per view match. I've got to hear this. This was a this was a good T V match. Yeah. That's about it. So, anyway, that's Impact, everybody. It's amazing. It is amazing. Go back and listen to the the recap that we did for the lockdown pay-per-view. Just listen to that recap, and then listen to this one again. And it's it's just boggles my 